Bon dia, Irina. Bom dia. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Only some words for people here in the room, and immediately we will begin with your presentation. Thank you for okay. coming. Ok. Obrigado. Ok. Uh, Obrigado. Good morning for everywhere, for, for everybody. And uh, usually we have these minutes uh, delay to accommodate people here in the room, but I think that uh, now we can begin, if you agree. Vamos começar então? Ok, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to chair this uh, new session of this new day in St. Martin Day, very important day for everybody. Day of generosity, we should say. <laughs> and so mm, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker today, who is Irina Zimontni uh, Kalinina. Sorry if I uh, mispronounce your uh, surname. And she will talk about Bible and the modern media discourse, phraseological units and proverbs of biblical origin in the Iron Logic Russian radio broadcast. So please, Irina. Thank you very much. Good morning. You pronounced uh, my name uh, correctly. And, uh, so thank you for introducing You're me. Right. And now, okay, uh, I have to share my present. Okay, I will share the screen with you. Okay. Sorry, because uh, the organizers asked me to close the PowerPoint. Now I will share it. Okay. Mm, okay, there it is. Okay, so the title is uh, can you see it? Yes, yes, we can see. Bible and the modern mini discourse, phraseological units and proverbs of biblical origin in the Iron Logic Russian radio broadcast. Uh, as an epigraph for my presentation, I selected a definition from the dissertation of Lisa Granbom Heronen. The concept of contemporary use. Uh, the host asked you to start your video. There is no video. Um, uh, so, uh, the concept of contemporarily used proverbs in includes proverbs that are alive. In other words, they are used today, no matter what time originally are from or if they originate from the Bible. The subject of our research is contemporary media material. We overviewed the results of the 10 months long monitoring of the Russian radio broadcast entitled Iron Logic. This program is broadcasted on Vesti FM radio station on weekdays and drew our attention by the extensive application of proverbs and sayings by its author, Sergei Mihaev, and his co-presenters. The monitoring lasted from August 2020 until June 2021, and has resulted in more than 400 cases of phraseological units applications with 200, more than 200 unique items. A major part of these proverbs, of the proverbs detected during the monitoring, are well-known so-called traditional proverbs, registered in the acknowledged dictionaries and relatively new but popular ones. We also registered proverbs, sayings, and quotations from literature, film, and music sources. Due to time limits, there is no chance to present today the total outcome of our research. We limit ourselves to proverbs and quotations of biblical origin traced in the uh, period monitored. Mm. In the editor's preface uh, to the sixth edition, uh, to the, uh, sorry, Uh, of the Oxford Dictionary of Proverbs, Jennifer Speak writes about the proverbs. Some have originated, as did many older proverbs, in a striking turn of phrase by an identifiable individual, but most have no pinpointable source. In this presentation, we we'll speak about the phraseological units which, which origin is well distinguishable. It is a scripture. The subject of this research is a contemporary radio broadcast dealing with current political and social affairs. Can we suppose that participants of this broadcast would address a source like Bible? The answer is yes, and we can refer to several reasons for it. Some of the quotes from the Bible have taken root in speech in different Christian countries as proverbs, are used day by day by native speakers, and are included by researchers in proverbs collections. Other Bible quotations, even those not listed in the proverbs dictionaries, 
can perform in the argumentation the same function, function attributed to the proverbs as ultimate truth in disputable wisdom. In our case, the author of the radio program, political scientist Sergei Mihaev, who is uh, 54 years old in 2021, declares himself as an orthodox believer. His knowledge and citing of the scripture is authentic. The program's permanent presenter and co-author Sergei Konevsky is 34 years old. The alternate presenter Alexander Andreev is 48 years old. And their discourse, we also find biblical preferences. We start with the most frequent proverb from all points of view. Uh, here you can see the uh, Russian original uh, uh, quotation, uh, literal translation, and uh, below the excerpt of, of, from the Bible, but I will read out uh, to save time only the literal translation. Uh, do not dig a pit uh, for another, you will fall into it yourself. In the multilingual dictionary of proverbs by Dulo Patsuloi, which contains 106 most frequent proverbs traced in 2854 uh, languages, the above proverbs occupy the ninth uh, place in the frequency rate. This proverb uh, uh, this proves its noble place among the world's most dif diffused proverbs. In our material, this proverb occurred five times, uh, speaking about the elections in the USA, Kornievsky. Here we have Nancy Pelosi. She is the leader of the majority of the Democratic in the Congress. She too is sometimes better, sometimes worse. Then she was giving an interview and suddenly in the middle of the interview, she interrupted and said, said good morning, Sunday morning, and she smiled. And the presenter didn't know how to react. Yes, very interesting, Mihaev. In general, the asininity grows stronger there, as they say. These people once laughed at our leaders in the mausoleum. Gee whiz, everything in life takes it like this. The wheel turns and you hit the back of the head. Boom, and so on. Do not dig a hole for another, as they say. You will fall into it yourself. So I think there will be very fun events for us. In the following example, we can see that the participants of the program take over the role of paralleologists and build a line of parallels for the original proverb, including not only a popular Russian proverb, uh, do not spit in the well, you will need it to drink water, but also an English one, people who live in the glass houses should not throw stones, behave. If you mention the United States, the same technologies that Americans are using with touch and to dance, and I would say triumph all over the world, including the post-Soviet uh, territories, have worked inside the states. Well, it's true, this has not yet led to a change of power, but nevertheless, they size parliament, uh, they put their feet on the table, showed that in general, all this is not worth a damn, and so on. This is a continuation of the degradation of the American political system, no matter what they say about this. Alexander Andreev, well, we have good sayings, like don't dig hole for another, behave, don't spit in the well, and all the jazz, absolutely correct. The British also have such things like you should throw stones at your neighbor's house if you yourself uh, live in a glass house. Yes, yeah, the folk wisdom says it, but at some point, at some point the Americans left uh, that like gods and, or demigods and decided that this does not concern them. The following proverb, I for right, tooth for tooth. The, uh, the expression which became a proverb occurs two times in the Old Testament and is disputed by Jesus in the New Testament. In the dialogue below, the political scientist adheres to the New Testament interpretation, Kornievsky. Where, well, they also note that Macron does not look civilized because he now blames the entire religion all at once for the ac actions of just one person. And in Islam, by the way, there is no law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There is uh, no such thing in Islam, and Macron is now trying to make it look like everyone will be blamed for run. He can get back, behave, because Macron is not a Christian. He does not believe in God at all, Kornievsky. Although, yes, perhaps uh, he is not a religious person, behave, yes, because for a Christian, this is quite obvious. Also, when Muslims say there are, these are Christian countries, who are Christian countries? Is France a Christian country? Is America a Christian country? There is nothing left of Christianity, but a real Christian, this principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, he does not acknowledge it. Uh, there are no prophets in their own homeland. Uh, uh, the two of synoptic evangelists, Matthew and Mark, convey these words of Jesus. A short excerpt below refers to the domestic situation in Russia. The political scientist claims an exaggerated Western orientation of certain social groups. In our country, we do not like to listen to our own people very much. There are no prophets in their own homeland. 
but the foreigners are listened very much. Uh, do not uh, do not cast beads before pigs. Do not let them trample it. In the following excerpt, Mihaly builds into his discourse just a fragment of the proverb originating, originating from the Sermon on the Mount. Applying such a creative linguistic tool, the speaker must be sure that the audience is familiar with the entire proverb and its meaning. Pearls in English translation are translated as beads in the Russian version of the Bible. This is also about the question I am returning from everyday examples to geopolitical ones, that these constant conversations where you need to consider their opinion, you need to move toward them. It would be possible to meet halfway if they would deserve casting beads. That's the problem. Our approach towards infects openness will not lead, unfortunately, to the desired result. Uh, give uh, Caesar to Caesar and God to God. The subject of the discussion below is the case of an Orthodox monk who created a kind of sect in his monastery. The appeal to the Bible in this case, again, using the tool of fragmentation is appropriate here. They didn't want a scandal and then there is such a thing. They didn't want to lose a person because the situation is right there. The question is not about the punishment. To punish is a matter of a secular court, a matter of a secular legal procedure. The question is to return a person to a healthier perception of himself and what is happening around. That is not to lose a church member because he was now excommunicated. He is lost, at least for a while. They talked to him for a very long time, persuaded him and so on and so on. But when it became clear that he might turn to violent actions, they had to give it, as they say, to Caesar. Well, and now Caesar is doing his job. In the next part of our presentation, we will see biblical quotes that are not included in the proverbial dictionaries. Some of them are well known, others need an indication of their origin. Immediately discussed, these sociological units practically perform the same role of proverbs, tools of argumentation wisdom. Do not make yourself an idol. Uh, the above uh, fragment of the second of the ten uh, command commandments was quoted five times uh, during the period monitored. The wording distinction between carved image and idol is caused by difference in traditional translating of the Bible in English and Russian. I am not against green energetics as such, not at all. I believe that where it is profitable, it should be done there. The only question is, do not make yourself an idol again. Do not invent another dystopian. Like, here we will now put windmills and everything will be fine. It will not work. Another example of the same proverb, therefore, Alan Blinken, these are such things like bonus prizes. Big guys came to Zelensky, he talked to them, he seemed to feel karma. They promised him something, he felt karma. And there is no guarantee whether they do it or not. And the most important thing is that regardless of Blinken, just imagine, there is such a thing a problem. The Ukrainian authorities believe in them as in gods. Here too, the question of paganism, do not make yourself an idol, is written in the Bible. You don't need to create idols for yourself from anyone, in general from anyone living in the world, in this world, especially from living people and especially from those in whose interests, interests you are used. Don't make idols out of them. By their deeds you will recognize them. The above quotation is uh, recorded in our files two times. In this passage, the nuns works work and fruit are synonymous with the general uh, meaning of, of result, uh, speaking about the pandemic and vaccination. Over the past uh, two or three weeks, the number of foreigners who are vaccinated here in Russia it is simply growing exponentially. Already hundreds of foreign citizens working here in Russia, including official representatives of various region, of various foreign media and diplomatic missions are vaccinated with this vaccine, including those media that are at the same time throw mud at Russia. Those states that are simultaneously imposing sanctions against Russia and spit in the direction of this vaccine. But when it comes to their health, they go here and quietly get vaccinated. Kornevsky. Well, you will recognize them by their deeds. Mikhail. Well, uh, yes, you are absolutely right. It is just a good litmus test. Where your treasure is uh, there your heart will be. When they're uh, talking about branding and advertising in their exaggerated appearance in everyday life, the political scientists quotes the Bible again, behave. They want all this to be shown on television, to be drawn on the universe of this football place and so on and so on, Kornieski. This is show off, just show off, behave. Well, that's uh, what I say. It's all from the state of mind. It's all from what is on your soul, in your soul, what is in your head. 
where the treasure is, there your heart will be. You do what is in your heart. <clears throat> A house divided within itself will not stand. Here we have an example when the representative of younger generation, uh, the co-author, uses a biblical quotation, speaking about the elections in Germany, Kornievsky. Uh, Sergei Alexandrovich, I liked the thoughts of some experts in particular about why are the Greens strengthening? Because in the CDU, CSU, uh, there is an internal dis discord and a struggle for power now. Is it, it is always undermining. As it is written in the Bible, a house divided within itself will not stand. We have exactly, Kornevsky. As I understand, this is happening now then. Uh, who is without sin, let him first uh, throw his, a stone at him. In the following ex excerpt, the Bible is quoted as a hint on certain personal qualities of public figures. The notorious George Soros, as you know, is a Hungarian Jew who comes from Hungary and has deep roots there. He has enough supporters uh, there, by the way. The fact that he is a Hungarian Jew, however, uh, didn't prevent him from being a member of neo-Nazi organization in Hungary in his years. In years. Well, yes, who is without sin, Kornieski. Errors of youth, behave. Let him first to throw a stone at him. <clears throat> who has eyes, let him see. In the next example, we see double level quotation because the evangelist also quotes the Old Testament in the biblical quotation with the negative construction. In the media discourse, the construction is positive. Use of the archaic uh, form in Russian points on its historical source. By the way, it's very characteristic. We watch CNN and the BBC and everything else. There is a lot about Navalny and not a word about, uh, at all about the Russian vaccine, Kornievsky. Well, they have their own behave. No as if it doesn't exist, but it does exist. That's the point, Kornievsky, and it feels pretty good, Mikhail, yes. That is, after that, let's draw a conclusion about objectivity and all that stuff. That is, it is impossible not to talk about it, but they do everything not to tell. And about some Navalny, who is really just a bubble, right? An inflated balloon. By the way, uh, there were few and fewer people there when his trial was taking place. Now they will talk from morning to evening. Who has, as they say, eyes, let him see. <clears throat> I, don't, uh, I do not do the good that I love, but the bad that I hate. In the passage below, the political scientist uh, makes a direct remark that he is going to quote the Bible, maybe because this is a less frequent, less known citation. I uh, often, often hear from the different people, well, those who protested against Lukashenko. They are not, uh, not all such bad people. They are all normal people, they do not want destruction and so on and so on. You could talk to them. I'm afraid that you know such a thing. With each separately, maybe it was possible to talk. There is a such strange phenomenon. When they gather in a crowd, they begin to move along the corridor along which they would not even want to move. As the Apostle Paul said, I do not do that good that I love, but the bad that I hate. <laughs> so concluding. As a result of the analysis of the radio broadcast Iron Lodging, we can conclude that the proverbs and quotations of biblical origin make about 6% of the total amount of the proverbs and phraseological units detected in the monitoring period. The wisdom of Bible is successfully used by the political scientists and radio journalists to evaluate or comment on current political and social events. In case of well-known proverbs, the authors of the program supports the audience to be familiar with them and do not dare to operate by fragmentation of the proverbs as a creative linguistic tool. When there is a possibly lesser known quote, listeners are warned that the biblical quote will follow. The quotes from scripture perform the same role of proverbs as a universal wisdom mean of argumentation, final summary. The proverbs of biblical origin are deeply rooted in Russian vernacular and have their stable position in the contemporary media discourse. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. I was very quick. <laughs> Any question? I have one, Irina. Uh, you yes. mentioned the, the age of the author and of the presenter at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, yes. How do you think this is important? Uh, 
I think that the general feeling that the Bible belongs to the elder people, uh, they go, I don't, they are dealing more with religion, they go more in, in the church. I don't know how is the situation in Italy, but when I visited Italy before the pandemics, I, I saw the elder people and the very young uh, bringing their kids to be baptized and uh, the middle age generation, maybe they are more busy working hard and maybe they do not uh, that's why I mentioned the word. So it means that the Bible is, belongs to, to all the generations, at least speaking. Uh, and generally saying about uh, uh, this uh, program, this uh, radio broadcast, and, and generally in the, in the media discourse in, in Russia, uh, I have a feeling that the, the Russian language is very probable, and uh, I can uh, see many, many uh, uses of the proverbs in, in the media discourse, either on radio and on television. Okay, thank you. Any other question? So I think we can pass to the second speaker. Thank you again, thank Irina, you. Thank for you being very much. Wi thank with you. us. Thank and you. so our second speaker today, which is in the flesh <laughs> here, is uh, Lucia Dolezalova. Is it correct? And uh, uh, she is going to talk about the proverbs at medieval schools. So please, it's here. I am very sorry. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Rui, and for all the organization. It has been really a great experience. Uh, today, I would like to speak about a project in progress. We are working with Michal Kovar, who will speak later today. But so far, we have worked separately, so this is the first comparison of our results just in front of you. Uh, our focus is, however, different. When I applied, uh, I wanted to speak about proverbs in medieval schools, uh, but it turned out a, a huge topic, much bigger than I will be able to, um, to cover today here. So first I will tell you some things about uh, what I will not speak about, and then I will focus on a particular text we are analyzing with Michal, and in the end, I would like to suggest some further methodology, although that will also be yet another challenge. Uh, what I will uh, not speak about, sorry, uh, are uh, universities, medieval universities. Uh, the reason is that it's a huge theme and it has also been much researched, much more than the lower schools I will be focusing here. But the material is huge and it's truly exciting. We have really a lot of material, not only on the curriculum, but also particular university speeches, which often include many proverbs. So I'm not covering it here, but I am giving just one particular example of a, an obscure uh, proverb included in a sermon of Jan Hus, not sermon, but speech, uh, a determination of a, of a colleague, Václav of Sušice. Uh, and each of these determinations, so these were like the promotion speeches for the bac baccalaureate and the magistrate, they always gave them a particular personalized speech for every uh, every candidate, and who was doing it quite a lot, and we have uh, many of his speeches. And they are actually a little bit similar to sermons. There is always one theme that goes through the whole speech and returns in different contexts and uh, different, um, it's interpreted in different ways. So this one is concerned with modesty. Fulget virtute modestus, a modest person glows with virtue. Uh, which is actually not a Bible quote, but a quote from a grammar textbook, Doctrinale, by Alexander de Villadei. And the little bit strange passage, I will only read the English, is, thence comes the common saying, stop when it is enough, 
so that a goose does not ridicule you. And in Czech, and now comes the Czech part, all that is convenient is good, the buttocks is skillful to itself. So it's not quite clear how this fits together. Uh, the go ridiculing goose is usually uh, interpreted as Jan Hus, the name means a goose, uh, speaking about himself. And it is true, he sometimes speaks about goose and he means himself. So that part would just mean uh, that I don't laugh at you, so stop when it is enough. But then you come to the Czech parallel and you wonder how the Czech translates the Latin. So it's all about modesty, about finding the middle way, about stopping when it is enough. And then you say all that is convenient is good, or maybe all that is good is convenient. That's not exactly the same. And the buttocks is skillful it to itself. It's more a proverb or phrase of pride. So the buttocks thinks about itself that it's skillful, but in fact it is not. So when you don't really uh, estimate your own qualities in the right way and you consider yourself higher. So uh, this is just one example just to show that the university material also should be analyzed uh, as far as proverbs are concerned uh, in much more detail and especially the Czech university material, because all the research so far shows very persuasively that at Prague University, the grammar was much lower level than at the University of Paris, Bologna, etc., etc. So uh, actually the grammar that was taught at the university in Prague was the level of the lower schools uh, in the West. So actually it would be uh, relevant to compare even for the study of lower schools, but next time. Uh, today, uh, so today I concentrate on the lower schools. Uh, that part is much less researched and we have uh, not so much direct material. For the Czech lens I have compiled 22 codices that are sort of school miscellanies, they include school material. There are excerpts from uh, ancient authorities, uh, there are some Bible excerpts or, or s brief sermons on the Bible, there is a lot of grammar, there is a lot of ethics, morals, but also riddles, poems and proverbs and it is usually uh, very much mixed. Yet the proverbs are not those that you would be interested in, this, they are mostly these moral maxims with very little metaphor included uh, about basic ethics. Uh, it goes according to the seven virtues and seven vices, so it's about humility, patience, charity, faith, uh, and it is just very direct, you should do this, you should not do that, <coughs> although they are rhymed, uh, and there is sometimes a metaphor or some little bit extra literary quality, but actually not that much. So mo most of the material is very straightforward and more maxim than proverb. I just give one example here, a very much used collection, Disticha Catonis, which is already from the late antiquity, and just uh, wanted to see you the structure. So uh, it first concerns about how you should behave towards God, then towards yourself, then towards your neighbor, then towards servants, and then there is quite a long passage about death. Actually, many medieval proverbs uh, are concerned with death. So the big, biggest topics are death and women, how the women are terrible. So these are the most, <laughs> most frequently uh, covered, uh, covered themes. In the context of schools, then, there will be especially important the topic of obedience. You should listen to your teacher, um, etc., etc. Uh, I mentioned I chose this Tichakatonis out of all the possible collections of maxims and ethical advice because we have a very curious Czech translation of the text which survives in six manuscripts, so it seems to have been at least moderately widespread. Um, and uh, there each of the two verses is translated in six verses in Czech and also some phraseology is often included, so it is quite, uh, quite a nice transition from the Latin 
into the Czech. And this has not been analyzed uh, yet at all, whether some of the Czech translations actually survived and entered the, entered the phraseology of the Czech language. Uh, I give only one example, which actually includes a metaphor, which, as I said, is quite rare. Do not wish to praise people too much. A bird catcher plays nice songs to the birds. So, well known. Um, and, uh, and then comes the six verses uh, in Czech, which tells the same, just uh, in a little bit more detail. So, we have this huge Latin material, mostly what you can expect, straightforward, no metaphor, boring. But we have this one uh, collection of proverbs which are actually in Czech, uh, and they are the oldest Slavic composition, oldest Slavic uh, collection of proverbs. Um, and that's the text me and Michal are uh, concerned with um, now. Um, why I include it here? Because it is included in a school miscellany of one crazy scribe, Crooks of Telj. So it is copied in the context of school, of lower school education, although it does not fulfill any of the characteristics that I have mentioned uh, about, uh, about the school proverbs. So, yes, it's in Czech, but also it's all metaphor and it is not straightforward at all. It is very obscure, very curious, and until today we have not been able to decipher many of these uh, proverbs. There are not only proverbs, but there are also phrases, and uh, there have been different, um, different theories about the origin of the collection. One of the options is that it, it's actually not a proverb collection, but it, these are extracts of some nice phrases and proverbs of a longer text. Uh, I personally don't believe it, but uh, we need to explore it more and maybe next year we will, <laughs> we will tell you more. Um, for now, I am, I am concerned with the contents and their relevance to the school environment. So when we look at the contents, there is almost nothing about God. There is almost nothing about death. There is quite a lot on the old age, but that's not really what you expect in a school miscellany, in a, in a, in a miscellany for children. And there are not so many proverbs of biblical origin, which again is something you would find normally in the school miscellanies. There is some direct advice, but the value of this direct ad advice is a bit doubtful. For example, teach your children to chew coal, but give me buns to eat. So this is not advice to pupil. Do not value a fool above salted herring. That could be, but, uh, <laughs> but again. Uh, and some of them are just not really didactic. Like, if you have power, you are in the right. If you have a dear friend, always punish him. If he refuses to listen, keep punishing him constantly. Again, you don't find this in school context. There are some themes that recur, uh, for example, poverty, but also I think there is a clear focus within this, <coughs> within this collection on things be not being what they seem, on different misunderstandings and difficulties of communication. For example, Frog thinks about it, itself that it is golden, a doe thinks about itself that it is bald, a wolf thinks it is sharp-nosed, a hedgehog thinks it is curly-haired. And uh, we can connect this uh, to the proverb we saw in Hus, this, the buttocks seems skillful to itself. So it's a clear, uh, clear parallel uh, and about like not being able to estimate what you really are. Or, I went to the woods to pick mushrooms, I mistook mushrooms for splinters, then I mistook gingerbread for a, sh for a shoe sole and ate it. So again, <laughs> you are not in touch with reality. Um, or, you are showing me a window and I see a door, you mean grass but it's vegetables, you long for honey but spill beer. The last one is a bit different, I realize, but you see the general idea that um, you, 
don't, uh, you don't see clearly, you don't estimate clearly. There is also a lot of irony and this makes the interpretation difficult because if you could assume about every proverb that it is actually meant seriously and there is some wisdom behind it that you want to transfer, it would be easier. We would try harder to interpret it in a meaningful way. But there are proverbs that are simply ironical. Straighten up like a belt in a coal or you are as straight as a sickle. When you get straighter, you will be like a horseshoe. That's not, <laughs> that's not serious, uh, that these are, well, maybe not proverbs, but phrases again, but, uh, but uh, they are not meant seriously. There is nothing to sue for, everything is full of holes. And th then there are many tautologies, which again are a challenge for interpretation. It is not the same with a tail and without a tail, or the way around is longer, the straight way is shorter. So, and there are many that are incomprehensible today. I choose just a few of them, uh, but any ideas are welcome. Nothing in nothing but a hood in six. The victorious should avoid Pisek, to each his own Poděbrady. Then the next one, it was translated like this by an official translator. We gave him the uh, collection to translate into English, but I don't believe this is true. When you see this Již blízko k telko Mahora, translated as Kutná hora, is now almost like Telč, uh, that <laughs> is no, nowhere there, uh, etc., etc. Now these are just a few examples. I will not dwell on them. Of course, we have ideas what they could mean. Uh, but it is not easy and we really need to search farther and deeper for parallels uh, to, get to, to get to understand them better. So, what about such a collection? Uh, is it a school collection of proverbs? Can we really see it in the context of medieval lower schools? Uh, one option is that it is indeed a strange and unique text. Uh, this idea would be supported by the fact that it was copied by this Crux of Telch. Crux of Telch was indeed a graphomaniac. He copied many, many uh, pages. He copied anything he came across. And it is in his copy that we have several unique texts we don't have from anywhere else. We have the orthogra Czech orthography by Jan Hus. We have a special um, special instructions how to find treasure, etc., etc. So he was a collector of curiosities. This is uh, this has been proven. So this might have been another curiosity he just collected because he collected everything and he copied everything. Um, but it could be uh, it could actually be used at school, although the uh, school education was not primarily Latin but it could be, uh, it could be uh, connected, uh, connected to school. It can be interpreted as being connected to rhetorics, which was, of course, important part of education at the lower schools. Rhetor in rhetorics, you were primarily taught about the metaphor, and metaphor was described as making access to the message more difficult. So the idea of medieval rhetorics and ancient one for, for uh, <laughs> as well uh, was that you have a message which is clear and the rhetorics teaches you how to make it complicated, how to make the reader uh, not access it so easily, but, uh, but forced to think harder before they understand what is meant. And uh, uh, so this would be actually quite uh, in line with these strange proverbs and strange phrases, um, that it is also a challenge for the reader. Also, uh, in medieval schools, a lot is on biblical exegesis. And again, Bible is obscure text by definition, is a text that we are striving to understand uh, the... Uh, sorry, yeah. I stopped doing it and you did it for me. Thank you, I am sorry. <laughs> I am an idiot. Thank you so much. Uh, so did I'm you... Okay, okay, thank you, I am sorry. I just completely... Um, 
<laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> okay, I will end soon. Um, so, uh, yeah, biblical exegesis is always uh, also like you are destined to fail in this world, okay? Bible is the secret code. You try, you try, uh, you interpret it in many ways, but you, uh, you will not succeed. It is just impossible to completely succeed, to completely understand God's word. So you, um, in the Middle Ages, you live with obscurity as part of the given world. So it is, um, it is just inherent in the world that it is also obscure, that there is part of the reality that is not accessible, that is not understandable, and it is fine, it is meant like this. So in this way, I think the mentality of the uh, medieval uh, men is a little bit different than, uh, uh, than the mentality still a few years ago. I think now we are actually getting uh, quite close to <laughs> this idea that there are things not accessible and there is not a progress that we know more and more and we learn from the past and we are better and better. This is waning and we are getting closer to the medieval <laughs> idea that there are things uh, difficult. Um, and uh, the last, just uh, now I'm getting to the last point about how also to explore this. So we can of course uh, explore, um, explore this um, through other uh, proverbs and phrases and comparing the, uh, the other similar, uh, similar sources, but we can also um, we can also try to explore the medieval associations, the way the medieval mind worked, like what were the quick connections. Now we have cunning fox, and that is still understandable to us, but there are many associations that are not accessible to us anymore because they simply change. Associations, of course, are culturally and historically bound. For example, this picture uh, is a sad picture. But uh, it is said because of a historical event. It's not said in itself. It's a nice sunny day uh, in some nice city. There is a ship. Um, so this would not be understandable um, to somebody from a completely different culture. But it is quite widely shared, considering this is very far from us. This is really not a European problem. But we all understand, we all share it. So the point is only that it's always culturally, historically bound. Sometimes it is shared widely, sometimes not so widely. And it's always, uh, it is always changing. It is always being transformed. So this picture, if you saw it still in August 2001, it would be a happy picture, but not a few months later. Oh, sorry. So for the medieval associations, we have some clear sources. We have iconography, St. Catherine and the wheel, clear connection. We have bestiaries. In bestiaries, every animal is connected to some characteristics. And again, this would enter the medieval mind and would, would connect these quick, would create these quick associations. And then we have Bible very strongly present. All the biblical characters have some qualities or are part of some um, some sort of context, bring up their story, bring up their character, bring up um, uh, some clear connotations, shared very widely because the knowledge of the Bible was shared very widely. But the last resource that I want to, among many, uh, mention today is the art of memory. Medieval art of memory was, the, was stemming from the ancient art of memory and was uh, concerned with creating images that you put into your head in order to remember something. And we, it was not like this that you remember patients by sheep, but often the picture is more complicated. And we have many, many, many treatises from the Middle Ages that describe these suggested images for suggested uh, characters, colors, numbers, etc., etc. And this source has not been yet explored 
uh, in connection to phraseology and associations. And I think it should be because it's again very nice, it's co it connects very nicely what the medieval mind would connect. And just uh, three quick examples for the, uh, for the end. Uh, ugly, if you want to remember ugly, you should uh, remember Rebecca offering shoes to the devil. That's weird. When you see Rebecca, you would look for the Bible, but in the Bible, there is, Rebecca is not ugly at all. And this is actually a medieval story about an old woman, Rebecca, who tricked the devil uh, and was really terrible and ugly, etc., uh, <laughs> etc. Et but it took me quite some time to find it. And the first time, actually, I found just a medieval phrase, ugly as Rebecca, and I could not understand it until I found it in the art of memory and until I found it actually in the frescoes and I found the, I found the story. Sorry, that was actually this picture. The next one uh, is about chimera, uh, the metal, uh, metallic as chimera or perchta. When you say chimera or perchta now in Czech Republic, we imagine the white lady that is in the castle as a, as a ghost. But it's, and, and it has nothing to do with metal, really. But it seems that there was this composed creature of uh, golden head, eyes of stagnum, copper ears, iron nose, silver beard, and lead neck. And again, I just found heavy as perchta. And I was wondering what it means, but then I found the art of memory and I could understand uh, the story. And the last one, uh, covered as the excrement of Neidhardt under the head. That's also a story that a nice boy finds a beautiful flower and covers it with a head and goes for his beloved to show her the beautiful flower. But Neidhart comes, uh, comes and sheets and puts the head over the sheet. So when the boy comes to show the flower, then, then it's not there anymore. Uh, so th that's another <laughs> association of the covered thing. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and very sorry for the complications and big thank you for your help. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Lucia, for this very passionate presentation. And do, do not worry, because as I told you before, we managed to follow you also without the slides, so it was perfect. And we have time maybe for some quick questions. No question? I have one, <laughs> just a curiosity. You mentioned the use of irony for educational purposes, and maybe it is a bit strange since you uh, was talking uh, you were talking about uh, lower school. And so what do you think about this? Irony and educational purposes? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mentioned irony as part of the flashcas uh, flashcas collection which does not fit the school environment. So uh, this was one of the features that makes it unlike the school environment. So uh, I'm sorry, again, it would be clearer with the slides, but, um, but uh, I described the normal school environment, which is Latin, boring, just simple advice. And then this, uh, this flashka collection, which appears physically among other school texts, really does not fit in. It is metaphorical, it is obscure, and it is not really very educational. You know, you tell somebody if you, who has the power is in charge, you don't, I mean, you could tell it as a teacher, okay, <laughs> so fine, but if your friend doesn't listen to you, punish him, and if he still doesn't listen, punish him more, etc., etc. And irony was uh, also mentioned in this context um, that, um, that uh, this is unlike school because you try to be more straightforward with the pupils and irony comes later because it can be misinterpreted and it can be difficult. So you are entirely right. This is not a typical school thing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other question? Okay. So thank you again, Lucia.
And I think we can pass to our third speaker um, today. I don't know if he is uh, ready. Marco Gasset from Germany. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> and he is going to talk about the Proverbs Go e-learning. So please, you can start, Marco. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad that I can be here for the first time. Also, it's only online. Uh, for me, as a young researcher, it's important to learn from experienced experts like you. And I, I already got some valuable insight, insights through these presentations this, this week. I said young, but as you see, I'm not very young anymore. Leaving my mid 40s um, next month, but I'm young in research. This is why, why I ask you for forgiveness if, if this is not very well prepared and not very scientific, everything, but I'm, I'm learning. Besides my part-time work as shoemaker, I pursue a professional doctorate, not a PhD. It's a doctor of ministerial leadership to enhance my proverbial project with some scientific insight. And I just started with literature re review this summer. So everything is quite, quite new and small. And with this short presentation, I want to give you insight into, into both my, my project about proverbs in an e-learning setting and my research, which hopefully will help to support this task with some scientific insight. So now I, I start the presentation. I hope you can see it. Yes, we see it, but maybe you have to uh, go to full screen. I have here full screen. You have no full screen? N no. We have okay, just uh, the full screen of, of your computer, not of the presentation. Good. Okay, what can I do? Um, I, I stop it again and and try to change the view in my presentation. They suggest me uh, there is a button on the bottom <laughs> of the presentation. I already yes, started so here. Yes, near the minor sign uh, on minus yes on, on uh, uh, down on your right. Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, maybe I have a uh, different view than you. There is a, re a red line at the bottom, a, a red line, then go right. And uh, when you have uh, plus, minus, close to minus, you have to click there. I, I think uh, I don't have you, your view. Um, here. Yes, to share the, the screen. And Sorry, may, maybe we have to do yes, it without. Now uh, it's perfect. Thank you. you can, <laughs> we got you can it. See it. <laughs> okay. I think I can't see what you see. <laughs> um, Uh, 
I now I can't go to my next picture. Good that we have some time and are early, but um, I don't get it running here. I tried it yesterday with my wife. It worked fine, but now it doesn't work. So my su suggestion is we 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 try it without. Yes, so oh. they suggest, oh, okay, maybe th Here's something. it is okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, um, to research purpose, you see this slide? Yes. Okay, my proverbial project started a few years ago before my doctoral studies. I love to teach the biblical wisdom books at church and a theological seminary because I saw that a valuable source of wisdom uh, is in them. Wisdom we still need in our modern times today. One day I realized that King Solomon from Israel was connecting with the wise of the world and entered into exchange with them at eye level. He even imported Egyptian proverbs into the Bible. From this, I understood there is wisdom in the observational science of the sages, whatever the religious background may be, because we live in the same world. Solomon's example inspired me to offer an intercultural exchange on the basis of proverbs via e-learning. E-learning has the ability to gather people from different cultures into one online course. Surveys also show that most young people prefer e-learning over in-classroom learning. And my, my project is twofold. First is an online museum. The webpage will be timelesswisdom.de. Uh, it, it will be ready around February, I think. There will be different theme rooms with different proverbs and corridors to reflect before and after entering into a room. And for now, I, I will start with each one text from um, Egypt, Sumer, Assyria, and the Bible. And with the time, I, I, I try to have more texts I add into this museum. And the second part is an optional e-learning course or e-learning courses about introduction into Proverbs and then about themes of the pro proverbs and they will be forum and project based so that the students are active and um, in contact with each other and work together. So I see the next slide won't come. Do you see the next one? How do ancient orient pro proverbs? No. This is really strange. We are still at the research purpose. So I, I think we have we have to leave it. Um, I, I'll send you um, the the presentation or um, and and the link later. So I, I I have just to to tell it to you. I'm sorry. I tried it, it works, and it, it did, but somehow not now. Is there a way to send the presentation and you can, no, there is no way, no. Unfortunately, it is not possible. Okay. So we will try to follow you without the, pre the slides. Okay. Um, and the, the title of, of this research is for now, how do ancient orient aphorisms make us wise through e-learning? And this, this is what I mentioned before is the setting where my research should bring some light and theoretical basis into. So uh, this is important because I don't want to, to unsystematically create an e-learning environment where the proverbs are ineffective and displaced.
And uh, the research problem is um, that there are differences regarding culture, language, and educational methodology between the ancient Orient proverbs and e-learning, which is aimed at people today. Ancient Orient proverbs, they, they use memorizing, for example, as their main vehicle. And this loses significance in most industrialized countries today. And e-learning on the other side takes into account decreasing attention span and takes care to avoid cognitive overload. Marco, uh, sorry, Marco, sorry if I interrupt you, but yes. here we have uh, our technician who has uh, some suggestion for you. Okay. Hello, good morning. I think good morning. You can pass, pass to the next slide if you press the uh, right arrow or the enter key. Yes, I, I do all, always, but it doesn't change on, on my uh, second screen and on your screen. I don't know why it, why it doesn't work. We, we can try to, to open everything again. I, I, I also order. run the, the slide show, but... You have, you have to select the uh, PowerPoint APP, and when you're there, you have to press Enter, and you will move to the next slide. Yes, I, I know. Usually it does it, but it doesn't do it now. Yesterday it did it. This is, uh, I don't know. Can we? I can uh, go out of Zoom again if you like, and we try to go inside. Even no, you can shut down the PowerPoint, open it up again, and then try what, what I'm telling you. Okay, I try again. Thank you. Do you see my screen? Yes, we see you. Yeah. Do you see the presentation? Not yet. Okay. Now, yeah. So go full screen. No, now you see it. Yeah, we see the presentation. Okay. Yeah. I can't go into full screen. Sorry, it. Oh no. So now you have to go. Well. Sorry. Um, Remember, you you had the the icon on the on the red bar, on the bottom part of the of your screen. You can go full screen there. I, I the slide show the uh, more more to the right. The next, next, N no. Next, th there. Press there. Sorry, I don't get it. Don't you remember <coughs> uh, near the minus sign? Yeah. This one. Let's show, okay. Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, well, you have to select the slide one, Proverbs Go e-learning. Select that one, <laughs> double click, for example. And now try to go to the slideshow, the icon that. There's no change, sorry. No, you have to press I, I in, the, in, the, in the red bar, the icon near the minus sign, it goes to the full screen. No. <laughs> it doesn't go. No. Uh, I could shut down the computer again. I did it this morning. But uh, what shall we do? 
I, I would say, uh, can't, can't I send you the PowerPoint that you can open it? You will have the, the, I don't know. What should we do without PowerPoint? Shut down the PowerPoint and open it up again, and we'll try. We did already. Time. Yeah. So another try. How is it for you? Yeah, you're sharing the screen right now. Uh... Do you have the PowerPoint? What is your screen? No, you have to press. Do you have Proverbs Go e-learning? You have to press twice to go full screen. I had I have it full screen. Okay, but you see a black screen here. Uh, Marco, could you try to do this wi with only one screen, not two screens? Because I think that the problem comes from there. But then I don't have my text because my it's in the reading mode. Okay, how is it now? Uh, now we see, uh, I know, yeah, we have your presentation here, yeah, in full screen. You have it now. Yeah, so if you can go you, you, to the next. You slide. see now the, the research purpose? Yes, yes. Okay, where, ha where have I been? <laughs> yeah, we have um, seen the next one, okay, thank you. Okay. Well done. Now I don't see what I have, but I try to, um, okay, I try to continue. Um, I think... We go to the research questions now. Um, there are the research question to bridge the gap I mentioned before and solve the problem between the modern e-learning setting and ancient methodology of the proverbs. And um, question one and two, um, which are the educational goals of the ancient Orient Proverbs and what are the underlying methodology to meet these goals? These questions work on the basis uh, to create a solid understanding about Proverbs and what they do with us. And with this knowledge, we now go into the translation process. And there we have question three, what insights skills are needed to profit from an ancient proverb? And here I put myself into the position of a learner who is not a paramedologist. What does he really need to know um, or be able to accomplish to profit from an ancient proverb? These elements have to be built into an e-learning course based on proverbs. In question four, which learning theories present the best framework to transfer proverbs into um, proverb-based learning into the setting of e-learning. And learning theories, um, they describe from different angles how learning happens, take, takes place. And here on the example of proverbs in the original setting. And question five, which didactic methods and technologies are most suitable to meet the educational goals of Proverbs. Now, with the help of these learning theories, we can translate the te teaching methods of ancient Proverbs into the didactic and technological possibilities of e-learning. And now we look at these questions at detail. Um, just a quick overview. 
of what I found and uh, citations you will later find in the document. Um, specific goals of cultures or single traditions um, or single texts uh, and also common goals I found. And uh, specific goals, for example, are preparing young men, young men for a specific position. Or common goals, for example, fair dealing with other social groups or character formation or fitness for life through the ability to deal with new or difficult situations. And educational goals are important to know because every e-learning project needs a definite problem or an educational goal. And then instructional design will tailor a specific learning route to meet these goals. Question two, what proverbs are not, they are not theoretical, not boring in classroom teaching. They are not just mechanical road to learning or memorizing of statements, but of course memorizing was important to have a wisdom in the, in the ready access memory, to have it with us in life. And how does a proverb reach its goal? A proverb can draw on the complex and manifold methodology and only a few examples. They are very convincing through black and white terms or de depicting clear consequences of a certain behavior. They demand us to think if there isn't any verb in a proverb, so difficult sentences. They provocate, they surprise, they demand responsibility because of their polyfunctionality. They can and need to be actively applied in different contexts of life. So in, in summary, proverbs are demanding thinking and activity from us. And the reason for this question is, I, I want to find out how proverbs create learning and how cognitive science can enlighten their function. The third question, there's a limitation I, I, I mentioned before, and this course is meant for uh, laymen, not for professional premiologists. And the, the needed skills, they depend on the complexity of proverbs. Some are understandable um, for children, others demand certain cognitive abilities. And there are some helpful areas of knowledge. For example, knowledge of the original cultural, cultural context and literal meaning, knowledge about literary devices like parallelism, knowledge of other peculiarities or features of proverbs like contrariness or polyfunctionality. And these are themes we have to, to cover, to teach during this course, or when we need, when we see a lack um, of an ability on the road, then we, we can meet them together in, in a group because it's a discussion-based, forum-based course. The fourth question, um, I show you the, briefly the, the key concepts of the learning theories. Uh, for example, behaviorism. Behaviorism um, is adapting to the expectation of the environment or positive and negative reinforcement, success or trouble, for example, to, to adopt or treat a certain behavior. And, and these are all features we, we see in the proverbs. Or we also see constructivism, learning in real life with the learner in charge for his learning. He constructs knowledge by applying 
actively a chosen proverb into life or cognitivism about the cognitive and social process processing of knowledge. For example, with their language and metaphors, proverbs connect, uh, connect existent experience of the learner to new, to new knowledge. Connectivism, the learner is actively connecting to a source of knowledge. For example, going to the wise, to the experience to learn. Actively seeking a suitable wisdom or proverb for a situation in life. We also see andragogy or adult education. Proverbs can actively be consulted where need in life is felt. Each proverb builds upon knowledge that already is existent. For each learning theory, there are correspondent methods to meet the educational goals in the setting of e-learning. Now we, in the, in the four, fifth question, we try to see what, what elements we have in e-learning for each of these learning theories we find in also in Proverbs. Let's see at behaviorism. We have, for example, predetermined learning paths, automated learning, quizzes, games. They give immediate positive feedback as a motivation for the learner. And also if he fails, a second, a third or more chances to try again. So he keeps motivated. Constructivism, e-learning may happen at an electronic device, but can be about real life subjects and be of relevance for life. Learners can collaborate on the on a project about uh, proverbs with relevance for real life. Cognitivism, lessons get chunked into digestible small sized pieces. Or a very new idea, artificial intelligence enabled adaptive learning. The artificial intelligence leads in the real path according to learner's abilities. So it automatically adapts to the abilities of the learner and gives him a new lesson if he is mature enough or gives him some, some old material to, to try it better. Connectivism. Don't aphorisms just have the right format and expressiveness for social media like Twitter? Even without the willingness to memorize, real wisdom could actively be shared and searched for. And at last, andragogy or adult education in a non formal e learning setting. A mature learner can show up for a proverbial lesson whenever he feels a need for it. So very flexible. This is what we can do with e-learning and these are only a few suggestions. I, I come here to, to an end and um, I have here a link for you. I, I can copy it also in the chat function. This is... Um, capstone project of my instructional design studies. And I present, I, I prepared there a small lesson about parallelism in, in Proverbs. And it's, it's, it's not perfect. It was more about uh, applying um, e-learning didactics and technology. So if you like, you can have a look and wander through the rooms and, and see how, how I built up an e-learning setting with, with forums, activities, um, working together in groups, groups. Um, but this link is, is dead. You can go there, but it's not an active course. So please don't share it with others, but you yourself can uh, look at this course and, and have a picture of an idea of how e-learning can be uh, as long as you want, because it, it stays there. But I will use this software, this platform also for the museum.
maybe for the e-learning course, I will use another one, but the mu museum I will set up in different rooms, like you can see in, in this platform. Okay. I hope you could see everything. I unfortunately can't uh, hear Marco, you. Marco, you have to turn your camera on. I did. Because we can see a symbol that your camera is off. I, I did, but... Uh... So uh, somehow we have a bug this morning. <laughs> My camera is on. I, I can try again. No, it doesn't work. But, but are you clicking on the link you show us? I think it's on the link. I, I can click on the link if you like. I don't know if it opens. No, we just see this black screen with the symbol that the camera is off. Okay, but I can copy the link into uh, the chat function. You have you have the link now there. Yes. Um, so it would be an idea to copy the link on the chat. I, yes. I, I copy it on the yes, chat. Yes, it could so be work. It is in your system. Do you have the link? Yes, you, you sent the link. But I guess I can't open it for you. I tried. I'm really sorry that, that my computer makes it difficult for you to, to oh, follow. It is what something that c can happen when we have online uh, presentations, so do not worry. So I can try to to share the screen again, but... I, is the link working? No? No. Uh, they say that the link is not working. So. No, now, yes, yes, now it's working. It is working. Do, do you see my screen now? What? Yes. Okay, um, if you see my screen, I, I just uh, go into start learning now. Do, do you yes. see the next window now? Yes, yes, because it is a Padlet, and so yes, it, oh, this is good. it has the uh, format something, of Padlet. Something at least works. Okay, um, yes. you, you can just wa walk through it if you like, and um, the introductory lesson, how it works, and just, let's just jump into one. And, and um, here's, for example, a forum. And uh, the forum, uh, there are questions they got in the lessons and they can write their lessons, uh, their, their, their conclusions or their ideas, um, can write them here and others can comment. Uh, and we just jump into a lesson. And here's a one week, the first week, and uh, there's an overview, there's an activity, and they can scroll here. And, um, and they, they have questions and they can uh, introduce themselves in the forum, they can write something. Um, what is wisdom and why can wisdom, why can we benefit from it? And here are videos. Um, I also have the, the texts available. For example, here, let's start reading the text. Here's uh, Shurupak, and they can read the text from Shurupak. I also have a podcast from every text. Here's the, the, the computer voice. I open it, I don't know if you can hear it or. Did 
Did you hear it or just me? So the, the, this is important for e-learning that the learners can, can choose what they prefer. Do they want to read the text? Um, do they want to listen to it? Uh, if they sit in the train, they can just listen to the, uh, to the wisdom, to the audio and get acquainted with it. And at the end of each week, there's, there's a kind of bigger assignment, um, kind of homework, what they should write into the form so that everybody can comment, read, learn from it and comment. And um, this is uh, this project, this capstone project is a three week project. And at the end, there will be a, a final project, a big project and learning artifact, which is also important to learn because with the learning artifact, learning gets practical, con connected into life. And, and this I want to do with, with the proverbs that they can create, for example, a small project where they see there's a need in their culture or in their environment and choose a proverb and col collaborate with others maybe to make a small relevant project on proverbs for their culture environment or whatever they feel as need. So this was just an idea for me. Feel free to, to have a look, to watch some videos or listen to the audios. Okay, thank you very much, Marco, for sharing uh, this learning unit, this sample of learning unit with us. I'm afraid we have no time for question. And so we thank you again. And now there is a coffee break and we will uh, meet again together uh, at 10 to 11. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Hello, uh, welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so, um, um, we are going to start uh, the next session. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce the first uh, speaker, uh, Nargiz Abdullayeva, uh, from uh, the University of Tashkent, I think, uh, I hope. Um, uh, uh, who is going to uh, talk about um, Jesus Christ? Uh, um, well, well. Um, uh, so uh, I, without further ado, and uh, without m more mistakes from my part, uh, I give I uh, give word to Professor Nargiz Abdullayeva. Welcome and thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your hot greetings. Um, it is uh, almost uh, afternoon in Tashkent, that is why I may, I may say um, good afternoon, hello to everyone. Uh, before beginning my uh, speech today, I want to highlight the work of our um, friends, um, Ruiz Suarez, Marinela Suarez, Autilau Hakangas, Wolfgang Mider, and so many others. And I have been uh, enjoying with such kind of ver uh, variety of themes uh, till today, for example, the role of proverbs in history, the role of proverbs in politics, the role of proverbs in internet, or the role of proverbs um, in even psychology, in art. So uh, as a linguist, I will speak uh, about linguistic features of proverbs today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, is it visible, my slides? Yeah. Uh, yes, the slides are visible, yes. Okay, thank you so much for your help. Okay, my research is called Proverb and Transaction for today. Uh, I am a PhD in Philology from National University of Uzbekistan. I'm always proud to be the member of this international family, we can say, uh, Association of Premiology. Okay, proverbs uh, are so, used... Sorry to, to, sorry to interrupt. Uh, the, the technical team is telling me to ask you to go to full screen with your presentation, to put your presentation yes. in full screen. Uh, thank you, and yes. sor sorry for interrupting. Uh -huh. uh, do you know how to do it? Yeah, I've done. No. Uh, is it full screen on my computer, but not? It's, uh -huh. uh, it's, um, it's, it's uh, on the, um, the left left down corner. Uh, there is a... Um, there is, uh, um, uh, it's the first icon on the left of the scale. Mm -hmm. Just a minute. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, 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 left. Right, oh, right, right, sorry, right of the scale. Ah, okay. Uh, Is it okay now? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet? Uh, we, we seem to be having some... Yeah, bottom, um, uh, bottom line, um, bottom line, on the left, the left-hand corner, um, you see where it says 68% uh, and all that? Mm -hmm. So there is, on the, on the side, there is um, a sort of... Um, uh, well, a sign with um, with um, with uh, oh, how, do, how do I explain that? How do I explain that? Yeah, well it's near the minus sign. It's near the minus sign. It's uh, the the icon near the minus sign of the scale. Yeah. Uh, 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 I'm seeing your mouse uh, lower, lower, lower. Uh, yes, 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 yes. That sign, mm -hmm. that sign over there. Ah, yes. this one, yeah. Yeah. Now, is it okay? Uh, not yet, but I don't know. Um, uh, well, I think uh, they are telling you to go on. To, uh, <laughs> Let's put the presentation again. 
I think it will be okay then. Okay. Now. What about now? Yeah, perfect. Is it okay? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you, so, thank thank you so you. much. Thank you for your help. Okay. So proverbs are used in communication in order to enrich and polish speech in any language all around the world. And they are considered to be not only language and folklore units, but also speech units. A proverb can function as transaction in speech, which expresses the logical and structural integrity of the speech form in active communication. Moreover, this function enables uh, the proverb's impact on the logical and structural integrity of the speech form while it is used by the addressee, speaker, or writer of the situation. A language changes uh, day by day, however, it's not a biological creature, but a social phenomenon. As it, as it appears in a society, live with the society and even may die under the influence of society. Therefore, investigating a language and their units furthermore, learning linguistic approaches is a process that cannot be limited. Linguistics is developing with the help of close sciences such as psychology, history, ontology, anthropology, and its inner fields as well. As language in the world has its own structure and each one has several peculiarities of its own, besides the language has the feature of duality, dual structural languages, structured, that is reflected in two main parts of linguistic procedure, pronunciation of linguistic units and the meaning or the utterance which they express. For example, linguist Martinet defines a language as a two pronounced phenomenon in his book, Elements of General Linguistics. And he mentions with his thought that a language consists of pronunciation of words and semantic sides of them. While anal uh, analyzing linguistics and its in the fields, one idea must be taken into consideration. A language is objective and at the same time, subjective one. It means a language reflects not only the universe itself, but also the factor of subject, person's influence to the activation of a language in a speech. A language is a complex system of lexicon and rules leading this lexicon. Speech is a free process to use a language in its lively. One can see the role of speakers and hearers in the utterance that is expressing in speech. On the other hand, language conversation is one of the important human activities and basic component of social life. A number of linguists have done research denoting to the functions of a language for many years. For example, one of them is German scientist Buller, in his book, he distinguished three main functions of a language. That's telling, it is a representation or definition of a thing or event. Ausdruck, Ausdruck maybe, expressions of informal personal features. And Apple, uh, the influence of information to the receiver and ruling his acts. According to this classification, the first function of a language relates with objects. The second and the third functions connect with immediately with the participants of a conversation, respectively. Moreover, Holiday also, in his book, cites three functions of a language. However, his classification differs from Buchler's one. Why? Because uh, in uh, his classification, the first ideational function means a language serves to express speakers' thoughts and ideas about the situation and his inner feelings. The interpersonal, it means a language functions to establish communication and conversation between people. And the textual function, a language complies with the function to form relations between itself and situational elements using in a conversation. The last one, the inner function of a language helps to implement the first and the second uh, functions. Holiday's classification is consider, considered to be more convincing and appropriate than the first one. The reason is the language is not only necessary to express an object, event, person. Uh, a person can explain something with gestures, mimics, or even drawing pictures. 
Moreover, language is dead without its, its usage in speech in real life. Furthermore, studying a language without paying attention to the role and influence of a person while using that language causes to define scientific paradigms about the language appropriately. Yeah, however, both classifications show uh, the functions of a language connecting with participants of a conversation. There are also other theories about the issues of relationships between a language and its user, like the two that are mentioned above. Based on those many ideas and theories, a new field of linguistics called pragmatics or lingua pragmatics or pragma linguistics, all of them are kind of synonyms, has appeared. Humboldt, Saussure, Chomsky, Sherba, and many other linguists have founded this field with their important scientific theories and approaches. However, here we may uh, highlight that Morris outlined three semiotic dimensions in his semiotic studies, syntactics, pragmatics, and semantics. Okay, pragmatics is concerned with the relation between sign and sign users. Syntactics is dire uh, directed to, towards the formal relations of signs to one another. It means among signs. And semantics concentrates on the relations of signs to the objects to which the sign are applicable. In 21st century, scientists May and Kim also write about the field of uh, pragmatics, its subject, turn, object, and many issues in their uh, works. However, pragmatics has its own inner specific, specific fields, uh, such as phonopragmatics, lexicopragmatics, morphopragmatics, phrasopragmatics. Consequently, it has become a wide field as Levinson writes, pragmatics is the study of those relations between language and context that are grammaticalized and or encoded in the structure of a language. So it is trying to investigate considerably new area of uh, pragmatics. It's called parimia pragmatics in this research. This term has not been used before. Only the term phraseo pragmatics is given by Luger in 1999 to distinguish the separate subfield of pragmatics that studies pragmatic features of phraseolog phraseologisms. And he cites these subfield, subfield processes, aspects of function, what is uttered with communicative intent, for, uh, fulfills a function and has a purpose. It's obvious that phraseology includes proverbs in it. Nevertheless, however, or proverbs have some peculiarities that causes to study them apart from phraseologisms. The first and main reason is they are characteristically used to form a complete utterance, not as a phrase or kind of combination. Make a complete conversational contribution or to perform a speech act in a speech event. Due to this reason, proverbs have their own study area that we call premiology. Secondly, proverbs are not considered only as a linguistic unit, but also folklore units because of their traditionality, didactic content, fixed traditional and ready-made form, social and cultural features. Proverbs are usually seen as authorless, sourceless, and also recurring. They are independent units of a language, therefore paragraphs collect and uh, un, uh, define proverbs as little texts and paramologists investigate their various peculiarities thoroughly. According to Norik's definition, proverbs unite features of the lexeme, sentence, set phrase, collocation, text, and code. So it should be added that they can also reflect the features of utterance, speech act, and even context, and sometimes all discourse entirely. The tasks of premium pragmatics are to observe which functions proverbs uh, fulfill in specific communicative situations, what is uh, their implicit meaning, purpose, intention, their speech act potential, and what do they mean as utterances and expressions in communication. 
For example, famous linguist, uh, premiologist Jason Sheck. I'm so sorry if I have mistaken pronunciation of his name. I respect him so much. Uh, he explains argumentative and non-argumentative text constituting and text structuring functions of proverbs as pragmatic aspects of them in his work. However, there are many issues to study and solve in paramia pragmatics from the theoretical and pragmalinguistic point of view. In this paper, we uh, want to focus not all pragmatic features of pr proverbs, but uh, emphasize uh, only functions of proverbs as a transaction in a speech. So what is transaction itself in linguistics, of course? The process of human communication is very complex as not only conversation participants vocabulary stock is essential in the process, but also his or her worldview, gained knowledge, competence, experience, social position, the factors of time, place, and situation in which the communication is being fulfilled. Each communication possesses a certain aim, of course. We call it intention in pragmatics. A speaker and a listener make conversation in order to reach a particular aim. Hence, this conversation conveys several categories such as logicalness, sequence, intentional, uh, intentionality, and result, of course. Consequently, conversation is a speech form that uh, owns the entire structure of its own, as it has uh, its micro units, constituents uh, that form the structure of the conversation wholly, and macro units, entire integrity of the conversation that includes all micro units of conversation in, in its own and forms on the basis of their mutual relations. In an active speech process, the formation of conversational macro unit is implemented based on semantic and structural integrity. Uh, we may call it in other, with other words like coherence and cohesion of the conversation. This integrity is cognitive linguistic notion, and pragma linguists call it this notion transaction. This word from Latin means agreement and contact. Linguists of Birmingham University, Sinclair and Cowthert, uh, defined the notion of transaction as the highest unit of conversation structure and the least units of structure joins in order to form transaction. Moreover, transaction is equal to micro dialogue in some cases. Linguist Stubbs agreed with their theory and conveyed that transaction is a linguistic unit that is placed in higher position uh, than word combination and sentence. Here, the main focus is on the structural units of a text and formal interrelations of linguistic units, which appear in the live oral speech. However, many linguists cited that the analysis of transaction at the conversation unit is not only based on uh, only mutual relations of formal and functional signs of a speech, but also semantic levels that are formulated on the basis of these above mentioned relations. Proverbs uh, also participate in forming uh, semantic and structural integrity, as we have uh, mentioned above, of a conversation, as they are often used in speech, especially in the Uzbek language. Uh, usually in oral speech, not written, I mean colloquial speech, conversations in daily life. As a result, the conversation turns to be touchable and, and emotionally color, colorful. Besides, the speech act is formulated in a short form conveying wide sense with the usage of proverb in a conversation. For instance, from English, it seems that Jack stole a few thousand dollars last week, but lost it soon after at the races. Uh, that is exactly what they say about money ill-gotten, ill-spent. In this context, this proverb is summarizing the idea of uh, speakers or just uh, participants of this conversation. Or next example, like father, like son, Toby the Welsh Terrier is undeterred by any challenge with family honor at stake. 
his uh, inquisitive nature just gets the better of him. My famous, famous dog, Oggy, who, ha uh, who has alternatively make, made me hate and love him for 12 years, has passed his tendency for being naughty onto his children. Genetics is a big mystery to me. I've discovered that not only do they pass their shape and color, but behavior patterns as well. This example was taken from British National Corpus. It's a kind of text which is uh, about real life, uh, not scientific, uh, not from uh, fiction. So uh, here, the idea is uh, defined, is disclosed with the help of uh, proverb as introduction. Usage of proverb as a first place uh, at the beginning of the text shows us what was the uh, real meaning, real intention of the speaker here or writer here. Why? So here writer wants the, uh, to emphasize that his dog, uh, I mean, the, um, his dog's children looks li look like to uh, their father so much, even in shape, even in behavior. Uh, so next example is taken from the Uzbek language and the proverb Yap topada is used in this situation. And the sentences that are given, the translation of these sentences in English, some students missed it several lessons. Some of you were late uh, for the lessons and some of you participated passively during the lessons. The sentence finds its owner. So here the sentence finds its owner, uh, defines, hints, points, so many students at the same time. So it means in some contexts, a proverb is used, is used in order to express not only one intention, but several intentions, several aims. Here I want to warn my students, which are which missed my lessons, which were late, and which but who participated very passively during my lessons. Uh, here, proverbs, uh, as a conclusion, I may tell you, proverbs are used in uh, conversation, uh, enrich uh, the speech with its meaningfulness, significance, semantic colorfulness, stylistic variety, effectiveness, briefness, and pragmatic potential. Proverbs are usually placed at the beginning or ending of the speech in order to disclose speakers or writers intention or summarize his or her implication as well. Furthermore, a proverb uh, is sometimes used to express two or more intentions in, in a context, as I give example from my own speech uh, in Uzbek and English. So poly intentionality is also characteristic to proverbs. All in all, a proverb functions as transaction. In other words, it assists to introduce, to disclose, to express or to summarize the addresser's idea in a conversation as a proverb provides effectiveness and integrity of a conversation in its sense. That is all about my research uh, for today. Thank you for your attention. Obrigada. If there are any questions, uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Um, I think there are there are a few minutes for one or two questions. If mm -hmm. anyone has uh, questions for Professor Abdullayeva, um, any questions? No. Uh, well, then thank you, Professor. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, hear your communication, and I call to the uh, podium. The next speaker of, t of this session, Professor Michal Kova Kovac, um, right? um, from the from Charles University of Prague, who is, do uh, oh, doctor, <laughs> um, uh, um, who is from the Charles University of Prague, and who is going to speak about uh, again uh, Czech medieval proverbs on their way to the present. Um, uh, and without further ado, please. 
<coughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My uh, <coughs> topic is related to the previous uh, paper brought by Professor Lucia Dolejalova. The name is The Journey of Old Czech Proverbs to the 19th Century. Um, next. So we share the same material. It's a handwritten list of more than 200 idioms, sayings and proverbs in Old Czech. And the, the list is dated to the end of the 14th century. Uh, there are among the uh, among the phraseological units there are about 30 or 40 so that that means one sixth of uh, of idioms uh, from the rest about one third of sayings and the less uh, and and the rest is uh, are the proverbia propria already the authorship uh, was later attributed to smil flashka of pardubice and it was first edited, published in 1827. <coughs> it, uh, later on, it was uh, also published in uh, the, the book Česká, Česká přísloví, Zbírka přísloví průpovědí a pořekadel lidu Českého v Čechách na Moravě a ve Slevsku, from the first, the per first part přísloví staročeská by Václav Fleischhans, who was the prominent uh, perennialogist of that time. Just to show you uh, some of the idioms and comparisons which are in the list. To be on Wednesdays out of home, quite unclear meaning. Tlačí ti povětřie nohami, to press the air by feet. Růost ti květi je pod nohami, to grow plants under feet. The both uh, idioms mean probably to be hanged up. <coughs> then comparisons. Hrabáš jako v kapustu, you are rem remaging like in cabbage. Brodíš jako v moře, you, you are wading like into the sea. Předeš jako v řez, you are spinning like heather. Běháš jako hůbiz jet, you are running as if you have eaten mushrooms. Stříliš jako po holubu, you are shooting like after a pigeon. And what is the goal of this project? We would like to discover the meaning of the proverbs, which are most of them are unclear to us. So the method is comparison to or with documents of that time. So this was this has been already done by partly by Fleischhans but he uh, focused mainly on uh, uh, canonical texts and by Professor Dolejalova, who uh, has quite lar larger uh, uh, corpus of, of the text, of the manuscripts of that time. And the comparison with later collections, the of those being not mere enumerations of the proverbs, but having some explanations added to the uh, particular proverbs of Smil Flaška. And the second goal is discovery of the rate of the proverbial survivors in modern Czech. So how many of the old Czech proverbs survived to the modern, mod, uh, to the modern era? The method is again comparistic comparison with collections published before 1827, so the, um, the year when Smil Flaška's list of proverbs was the first time published, and with uh, collections of proverbs which are authentic, authentic uh, so not mere compilations of previous uh, anthologies, which is the case of for example, Čelakovský or Jan Nepomuk Starek collection. And comparison with language and library and textual corpora, which is a bit problem because we have to make a quest by putting, uh, uh, putting some kind of translation of the old Czech proverbs into the modern Czech when searching for 
equivalence. There might be uh, some uh, misunderstandings of, uh, of the old uh, Flashka's old pr uh, proverb. I have one, one example, červenému se nerůhaj a červen nebudeš. Do not blaspheme against the red and you will not become red. So far we, uh, relied, we have relied on the motivation uh, of the, the physiognomic motivation of a face redding when someone is being ashamed. So, so far it, was, uh, it has been interpreted like when you have anything to do with the devil, you shall be ashamed later. However, in Michel Pastoureau's book uh, uh, about uh, symbolism of colors, I found a uh, German medieval etymology from the 12th century of the name Iska Iskariot, uh, the one from Kariot, you know, the, uh, the surname of Judas. Istgarot, that means he's completely like it, this <laughs> He's completely red, that it means he's completely like the devil, namely, he's completely evil. So we can reinterpret the, uh, this particular proverb in a way that when you have anything to do with the devil, you shall become evil as well. So there is slight difference between uh, the physiogno physiognomically motivated and symbolically motivated interpretation of the proverb. And one uh, not nota bene, uh, this is an ongoing project, so the outcomes I will be showing you are only preliminary or even hypothetic so far. What collections we have? Uh, the re the pro the first collection of Czech proverbs we know is, uh, uh, the ma uh, uh, is in the manuscript Tripartitus Moralium by Konradus de Halberstadt, who was a, uh, a monk living in Prague, but uh, of uh, Saxonian origin. And he was also a friend of uh, the uh, noble family of Pardubice. So <coughs> th there we can see maybe to which Smil Flaška of Pardubice also belonged. So there might be some kind of uh, interest in the family of, Par of the noble family of Pardubice, interest in, in, uh, in proverbs. So then that's the list of the uh, Smil Flaška's proverb from the late 14th century. And then we have uh, another uh, proverb collection Dicteria seu Proverbia Bohemica by Jacobus Srnecius Varvajovinus uh, from the end of the 16th century. And then we have uh, 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 two collections done by uh, bishops of uh, the unity of uh, the brethren, which was a reformed church founded in, in the 15th century in Bohemia. So the first one is uh, Matej Červenka's and Jan Blahoslav's collection of proverbs from the 16th century. And the second one is uh, uh, the collection Modros Starých Čechů and so forth. Uh, wisdom of, of old Czechs done by, made by Johannes Amos Comenius in, uh, in the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, the rate of Smil Flaška's uh, proverbs goes down uh, in, in when going further in the s through the centuries. But uh, there in Blahoslav's and Komenius anthologies, there are still um, many of uh, Flaška's proverbs and they, there are also uh, explanations of, of the proverbs in their uh, anthologies. And then there is another Baroque uh, uh, collection of proverbs done, uh, made by Wenceslaus Johannes Rosa, Thesaurus Lingvae Bohemice, Quadripartitus, uh, which is a dictionary, but there are also, uh, there are all in the dictionary, there are also um, proverbs. Just a, s a s small point to the character of Blahoslav's and Komenius' uh, explanations. So Flaška has 
a proverb, straka zekře a dvě v keř, a magpie out of a shrub and chew into it. And uh, in Blahoslav uh, there is an explanation. Therefore we will not be dear to God if we abandon him, since he finds plenty of servants, but poor us without him. So it's very strict and limited explanation like the for, uh, in terms of the function of, of, of the proverb. And probably it, was, it is motivated by the, their role of, uh, or Blahoslav's role of being a bishop of, of, of the Reformed Church. And then there is a, uh, so this appears in the, b amongst his explanations many times. So we should be a bit cautious about, about hi his explanations of Flaschka's uh, proverbs. And then there is the Comenius explanation. When something is multiplying against our will to such an extent that it is impossible to resist. So it, this explanation is much more general. And then uh, the modern Czech proverbs from the 19th century. So there are the auth authentic, authentic one, uh, proverbs collected by the people, <coughs> not, from, not compiled from uh, previous uh, collections. So some Moravian proverbs done made by František Dobro Dobromysl Trnka, proverbs of Slovaks from Moravia and Hungary, then Silesian uh, proverbs, uh, which were published in Vlasti Vieda Sleska in 1888, and then uh, uh, collection by Jan Javornický, clarified Czech proverbs or depiction of beautiful vir virtues and disgusting frailties, and František Rozum, uh, moral maxims taken from Czechoslavic proverbs, and many others. My main source is uh, this Frisuchainer Bemission phraseology uh, made by Matthias Josef Sichra. Uh, this was published in 1822. This is actually a phrase, phrase book <coughs> um, meant as a uh, 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 as a uh, help support for those German-speaking persons who would like to learn some Czech. And I like Sichra also because he, oh, no, okay, so I will skip this information. And what is the char character of, of uh, Sichra's phraseology or phrase book? He uses uh, uh, alliteration, so, but he uses alliteration mainly when he wants to uh, differ his own phrases, his own sentences from uh, authentic fo folklore or authentic phraseology. Uh, by the way, he was a priest. So, and I, I, so you can see uh, alliteration. Podělal se, že příliš počišťujícího lékařství pil. Er machte unter sich, weil er zu viel von dem Laxiermittel hat. So he shitted in his pants since he had drunk too much laxative. So <laughs> quite modern uh, course book of uh, Czech and another one. Po otevřeným poklopcem procházel se pokladník po ulici všem počestním k pohoršení. The complete alliteration. Der Schatzmeister lustwandelte auf der Gasse mit äh, halbufenem hu Husenlatze allen vorübergehenden zum Erge Ergernisse. So the cashier walked on a street with his half open fly to an annoyance of uh, many passers by. And so Sichra. Uh, Sichra's collection is uh, the authentic one published before the first publication of Flaschka's list. Uh, so now there are some matches which of uh, examples of proverbs which are 
both in flashcast list and bo in sichras list as well. So, boje se chřestu nechoď v les, kdo se chřestu bojí nechoď do lesa, being afraid of crackling, do not enter the forest. Quite clear. And in some, uh, after some changes, we, we, have this, uh, we have this proverb even in the, in the contemporary Czech. The second one, vy zase před sebou uzříš. Uh, the, I'm not sure about the equivalent, Sichra's equivalent, oči sluší i v týle míti. So flashcast, look back, you shall see before you. Sichras, it's better to have eyes in the back of the head. Uh, probably the flashcast flash uh, proverb deals with a temporality. So you look back in a time and you will see before you in terms of time. And, uh, but but Sichras proverb is about co being co cautious. Then, ač žebrák sita, ale možná nesita, the same in Sichra. Though the beggar is satiated, his back is not quite understandable, in intelligible. Kup si je a břehu si je drže. In Sichra, drž, uh, keep nearby a bank when swimming. Sichra, drž se břehu, nechceš li utonouti. Keep nearby a bank if you don't want to be drowned. Also quite intelligible. Sometimes we find uh, combination, combinations of different parts of one proverb or, <coughs> or more proverbs or reductions or extensions of the proverbs. So in flashka, that's the F. Česati ano nesvrbí, stonati ano nebolí. To comp when it's not itching, to be sick when it doesn't hurt. So it, had two, it has two parts. In sichra we found drbá se Ano ho nesvrbí, he scratches all by it, it's not itching. And kde tě nesvrbí, nedrbej, obsem když chce spátí, za ocas netrhej. Do not scratch wherever it is not itching, do not pull a sleepily dog's tail. And dva jista jedno, jednomu pán a tři je celé vojsko. Uh, in flashcard the meaning two or maybe two hundred or two are a master uh, to one and three the whole army. So this in, in Sikra we have dva jednoho pan, two are a master to one. This is uh, a universal uh, European proverb which might be found in at least German and uh, amongst German proverbs and Polish proverbs and it goes back to uh, the Latin Ne Hercules quidem ad versus duos. Uh, all, all we found quite similar proverb in f f uh, Flaška, Flaška's list and in Sichra's collection. They might sometimes have a different meaning. Uh, Flaška ve mlíně hudba neplatí, in the middle the music is not valid. Sichra, ve mléně nehuť a ožralce, když spí nebuď. Don't play, don't play music in a mill, neither wake up a drunkard when sleeping. Uh, this is not the, the same proverb, but two proverbs um, dealing with the same Im image, with the same picture. So probably the first motivation is uh, th that everything has its price. You cannot pay in the mill by just playing music. Then it might mean a uh, pointless activity, and then in Sichra's proverb, it has meaning of a harmful activity. Then, uh, flashka. Ale umie hrušky klátití, avšak ich nepřevaří. He knows to sway down peers and will not overcook them. In Sichra, neklaď hrušek, až dozrají, hrušky v popeli nezapomíná. Uh, there are two, two different proverbs. Uh, with uh, explanation in German, er ist ein guter Wirth. Uh, and an added explanation in Czech, správní lidé neklátí se, se, se stromů, co plané hrušky. So, uh, don't sway peers before they are ripe. He doesn't forget peers in ashes, with the meaning he's a frugal. 
and the right people do not sway down from trees like wild peers. peers. <coughs> and uh, another example, flashka, nevždy rak na mlíně, někdy radši se. There is not always a crayfish above the mill, sometimes also a female crayfish. Zichra. Uh, Ne vždycky rak na mléně, někdy také žába. There is not always a crayfish about the mill, sometimes also a frog. Uh, the combination between male crayfish and female crayfish in, in, uh, in Flaška's collection is quite unique. We have this uh, proverb in, in many collections, but always uh, there is a uh, the pair is a crayfish and a frog, which is quite understandable, because that in the meaning, in the meaning, you win some, you lose some. Uh, and I, I think there is no sexual dimorphism in uh, in the crayfish. So crayfish, they don't have sexual dimorphism, so it doesn't matter if you, if you catch uh, male or female cray, crayfish. It's possible that Flaška made an, uh, an anti-proverb in, in, in this case. So the proverb was known in Flaška's time, but he made an ironic anti-proverb. Uh, conclusion, in modern Czech, and I mean it here, uh, I mean here the, the, the Czech from the 19th century on, we have found 32 probable equivalents of the old Czech proverbs from Flaška's list. Uh, and I, not, I, I have not searched only in, uh, in Sichra's collection, but also in uh, uh, the Czech Na National Library's Kramerius engine, which is a library and textual corpus. And uh, only few Flaška's proverbs occurred in uh, in in the uh, ma mainly texts published in the 19th and uh, early 20th century, and mainly if they occurred occurred mainly they occurred once or twice only, and their use was limited to the genre of the historical novel, and uh, thus they served rather as a historical backdrop. Nevertheless, their reinterpretation and recontextualization went often beyond my expectations so they are offering some at least possibility pos uh, oppor opportunities how to understand uh, flashka's uh, proverbs there is one exception mini uh, stravu uh, anzele that's the proverb or saying better uh, which uh, occurred several times you mean grass while he cabbage or vegetables so uh, it, uh, and uh, it occurs more than three times and i found three different meanings of, of this proverb the first one is your speech is meaningless that means each of you are talking about different topic or the the other person is uh, beautifying overestimating something or uh, you mean grass while it is cabbage we say when what wanting to po point out that someone is not aware of an advantage being opened up to him or her and this is quite uh, uh, from a quite bizarre source uh, Zemědělské listy agriculture uh, news and prob I'm not sure if this information that we say, sh uh, shall we take seriously that it was uh, to uh, the editors of, of the newspapers, it was really known, this um, uh, proverb, or they took it again from another source. How many times? How much time? Maybe I can... This is a postscriptum, which is not necessary. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, we don't know exactly if Smil Flaška of Pardubice is the author of the, of the list of the proverbs. 
and some people say he was not, some or he is, or, or he is not. And uh, uh, there is a fact uh, that uh, Smil Flaška has a dispute with the king Wenceslav III uh, about uh, some family property. And in the list, there are lot, lots of proverbs on richness and poverty. And some of them are e even praising property and defaming poverty. So it may be in uh, a relationship to the historical fact. And just to show you the some of uh, some of the most curious ones, zbožní si lidmi kaže a hubení sám sebu. The rich atones by people, the poor by himself. Nůze není je sestra ani bratr. Poverty is not a sister, either brother. Zbožný má přáteli, hubenému jich třeba. The rich has friends, the poor needs them. Lačný i těstostně nůze ke všemu připudí. A hungry one eats even doth. Poverty forces to anything. Zbožný se ctí, mladostí zbude. The rich loses his youth with honor. Chud nevěren, chudoba věru láma. The poor is unfaithful. Poverty breaks the faith. And z drobných ptáčků nejlepší je. Uh, who's amongst the little birds, the goose with E, is the best. And thank you for your attention. Obrigado. Thank you so much. Um, we still have time. We are still slightly behind, uh, ahead of schedule, so we have time for one or two questions. If anyone wants to ask a question no well I have a question <laughs> well not not exactly a question but a comment um, uh, in your presentation and that of uh, uh, professor Dol Dole uh, sorry um, um, sorry 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 um, in in the in the in your bo in both your presentations you um, you gave the example the examples of several uh, proverbs from Flaska's um, collection that um, reminds me slightly uh, well, it, it is it is probably not related, well, almost certainly not related, but it reminds me slightly of some uh, uh, sayings, um, which are also not quite proverbs that we are used to, but um, it's quite some sayings in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, so, for example, when you said there um, to be out of to be out of uh, home on Wednesday. Uh, it does remind me because it is we, we don't know why what what's the point of being out of home on Wednesday. Um, you, you it does remind me of uh, that famous riddle. Uh, I think it's the most famous riddle in uh, Alice in Wonderland, um, uh, which is why is a raven like a writing desk? Uh, and the point is it's not to be guessed. So uh, I'm I'm just I'm just suggesting and it's just to tease you um, uh, whether uh, Flashka's proverbs, especially the the most weird ones, could not be some 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 sort of game or nonsense game, um, because I mean it's not unheard of in the Middle Ages. For example, we all we all in the field remember uh, that um, that um, Voynich manuscript, which we still which which we still tear our heads uh, about today. Uh, so uh, there were games like this. So do you think it could ever possibly be a sort of nonsense game? Uh, some people they uh, they believe that many of Flaska's proverbs are just his own, um, um, he, he made them yeah, by himself. And uh, this uh, Wednesday proverb, it, it has two meanings. Uh, one is, at least we think it, it has two meanings uh, or, or alternatives. And uh, one is uh, uh, based in uh, the polysemy of the streda of the Czech word, which has, it means the, like in Mittwoch in, in, in Germany, it's in the middle. And it's, it, it is a sexual, so not to be on in the middle of a, you know, of a woman at home, it, it means to, uh, to have no a sexual life. Right. And I'm a quite, uh, I don't know if this is like, <laughs> possible to interpret it like this. And there is some, uh, another possibility that stre streda 
uh, is, uh, uh, is mis, uh, miswritten and mistyped uh, and should be sieda, like the middle of, uh, of a breath. So no, not to have uh, access to, uh, to a good food and yeah, perhaps, but we don't really know. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'll just ask you all to join me in a round of applause um, because yeah, this was very good. <laughs> and um, without uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce the next uh, 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 speakers who are um, uh, Drs. Magdalena Filari and Camelia Zabava, uh, uh, one of whom will be here in present, in, present, uh, in, 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 in present mode with us, and the other will join us through uh, Zoom. Um, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here for the second time, and thank you to Rui and Maridella for the excellent organization, as always. I will... Um, pass uh, my presentation with my colleague from Romania, uh, expression of opposition in Romanian and Polish paramiology. It is known that the proverb is an impersonal, very old expression and wrote with authority and bringing wisdom. They um, suggestively express the result of a long experience and contain moral teachings. Their contents are profoundly philosophical, focusing on moral issues and advice which are applicable in different life situations. The message of the proverb is not communicated directly, being a paraproverbial content. One of the fundamental themes of folklore is the battle between good and evil, the force of good triumph in confrontation with the force of evil, which gives, gives it an important ethical and moral value. This idea is found in folk songs, fairy tales, and last but not least in proverbs. According to Jerzy Bartmiński, Polish linguistic et ethnologist, the relationship between language and the world of values can be summarized in the following way. The first one is language is an assessment tool, contains a rich arsenal of formal means used to express opi opinions and values. The second one is it's that language informs about values. Values are grounded, stored in language and assigned to language units. And the third one, language is a bearer of values and serves as a substrate for the manifestation of values. Among the proverbs, there are numerous examples of values. In this presentation, we analyze the antithesis in Romanian and Polish proverbs expressed by the concept of good and bad. As Jan Schmidt, Polish historian of philosophy, observes, there is no a systematic increase in interest in tradition and uh, traditional values. We will show, referring to selected examples, how many references to values can be found in traditional proverbs. Proverbs often contain terms good, well, goodness, which helps to expose what is a valuable human experience and what is valuable to us. In order to better emphasize an idea, it is often used in relation to another idea, either by comparison or by opposition. In this presentation, we chose to present a series of proverbs built on the principle of opposition. In contrast to comparison, the opposition is much stronger in showing the qualities of a person or object in relation to their defects or in emphasizing the positive side of a situation in relation to its negative side. This fact confers, in addition to the moral effects, also the didactic one. So, we classify proverbs according to the most common opposi oppositions used in the two languages, in Polish and in Romanian. Okay, so we have the first pair, it's like good versus bad, or well versus wrong. Better to live short and well than long and bad. Better less and good than more and bad. And in this case, the good-bad opposition is doubled by the antithesis less or more. We have the Romanian proverb that is good in all evil. On the Polish, what starts wrong ends well. Or the other ones are the bad thing is expensive, the good thing is cheap, it is so good, why it is so bad. After rain and storm, good weather comes. And here we know that rain and storm, it's bad weather, of course. 
Or we have the Polish proverb, good lawyer, bad neighbor. So the other part is good luck and bad luck. The lucky one at the game is unlucky in love, who has luck in cards, doesn't have luck in love. In the first variant, the opposition is made at the level of the noun, and in the second, at the level of the verb, by but negation has, does not have. This proverb is found in both Romanian and Polish, with the mention that in Romanian, luck is luck in cards is conditioned by misfortune, bad luck in love, while in Polish is the opposition luck in love is conditioned by bad luck in cards. Friends versus enemy. Better a poor enemy than a foolish friend. Or look for a friend close and for an enemy far away. Protect me, Lord, from friends because I protect myself from enemies. Yout versus old age. Who does not learn in yout will cry in old age. Lazy yout, weepy old age. Or what you learn in your yout, you know in your old age. Uh, we have also a Polish proverb, what Yash will now learn, Jan will not know. And in Polish, the position is manifested at the level of the person's name. Yash is the diminutive for Jan and refers to childhood, while Jan is uh, the anthropophonic variant used in adulthood. Rich versus poor. The rich man eats when he wants, and the poor man when he can. The poor man eats as uh, best he can, the rich man eats as he wants. Better to be rich and sick than poor and healthy. Better to be beautiful and rich than ugly and poor. Uh, today versus tomorrow, we love today, who loves today cries tomorrow. Don't live for tomorrow what you can do today. And you don't know what uh, the will turns today to me, tomorrow's to you. And here also we can observe the pronominal pair to me to you. Small versus big. The big fire ignites from the small spark and a big cloud but a small rain. This proverb has an equivalent in both Romanian and Polish. Both have a ref as a reference point a primary natural element, fire in Romanian and water in Polish. And little children, little trouble, big children, big trouble. We can find both Roman in Romanian and Polish language. Valley versus hill. The reference is made in association with the relief forms and suggests the idea of from top to bottom. And the idea is also marked by presence of another series of verbal antonyms, climb, come down. In the valley you slide slightly and on the hill you climb hard. A lot versus a little. Who can do a lot can also do little. It's too much for a cat, too little for a dog. Or a cow that roasts a lot gives a little milk. Bitter versus sweet. A bitter medicine cures sweet. Patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. And true versus lie, better than a true than a good lie. The truth upsets and the lie pleases. Okay. In the conclusion, we can say that the presentation in opposition of some terms, situations, or characteristics had a strong impact uh, on the ed education and formation of many generations. By resorting to opposition, we actually obtain a life lesson in which the examples are presented in black and white, and in which we can clearly distinguish not from yes. Analyzing these examples from a million and life experience, we can observe that most of the proverbs were built on the good, bad opposition as the main idea. The other terms of the oppositions in the Romanian and Polish proverbs that we had presented refer to phenomena, feelings, and characteristics of objects around us, like fire, water, yaut, old age, good luck, bad luck, etc. The presence of the this opposition mm -hmm. is the proverb transforms that into small capsules of wisdom and into small handbook of life. Thank you very much. Obrigada. Obrigado. Uh, congratulations. Um, uh, 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 I don't know. Uh, uh, Rui.
No? Okay. Oh, uh, so um, uh, there are no there are no more speakers in this panel. So we have um, we have we have quite a lot of time actually. Uh, so uh, uh, all those who have questions can ask um, Professor Filari uh, their questions. Um, are there any questions? No questions? Well, um, so uh, I call uh, all the all the speakers in this panel um, uh, who are here, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Michal Kovarz and um, Prof uh, Dr. Magdalena Filari, and um, in absence, uh, uh, Dr. Nargiza Abdulayeva. Um, uh, please come come to the front to receive your diplomas. Oh, and uh, sorry, and the, the people in the previous, in the previous, um, in the, pre yeah, everybody in the morning, sorry, uh, my mistake. Uh, that is, um, uh, well, um, that's all of the presence uh, of the present people, so, um, yes. Uh before to give the certificates for all the presenters in this morning, uh, I profit this moment uh, to make some uh, uh, homage to, uh, to fellows, to great friends of us that by different reasons, namely by health reasons, cannot be uh, with us here in Tavira. I refer just František Zermak. I, <laughs> and uh, Gula Pak Solai. Uh, if you are listening as in uh, Re Czech Republic or in Hungary, uh, please accept our warm regards and our wishes for better health. Thank you very much.
good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Pirat Wolait, uh, and uh, I'm extremely happy uh, to uh, chair this afternoon session of our colloquium, St. Martin Day's uh, afternoon session. And uh, during our session, we have uh, uh, three uh, uh, presentations. Uh, two of them are online, virtual way. And we start uh, uh, with the presentation of uh, Christian Grandel. Uh, everybody knows Christian Grandel. Uh, he's a, a vice president uh, of uh, our organization. Uh, he comes from Germany, uh, from Würzburg, and uh, will speak today about uh, uh, the modern uh, German proverbs, the lexicon of uh, modern uh, German proverbs. Uh, and um, I encourage you uh, to ask questions also uh, in YouTube uh, channel uh, if, uh, if online. Uh, you are follow following us uh, via YouTube channel, uh, so please uh, write your questions and uh, uh, comments. Uh, I try to read in one eye all the time also uh, this channel. So Christian, floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for your kind words, Spirit. With the advertising slogan, es gibt viel zu tun, packen wir es an, in English, there is much to do, let's get started, of the ESSO Deutschland GmbH, a worldwide known trade name of the American multinational oil and gas company ExxonMobil, that has become proverbial according to Wolfgang Mieder in the year 1974, and this article of 2018, Neue Zeiten, Neue Weisheiten, Plädoyer für eine Paramyographie und Paramyologie moderner Sprichwörter. In English, New Time, New Wisdom. A plea for a paramyography and paramyology of modern proverbs. In which he asks especially paramyographers of his German mother tongue, but repeatedly also the international paramyography, to dedicate themselves to modern proverbs of their respective languages. I quote, Paramyography cannot remain a science that looks primarily backwards and works only with texts of times gone by. Modern paramyographers can and should also assemble proverb collections that include the texts of the 20th and 21st centuries, states Wolfgang Mieder in his fundamental introduction, Proverbs, a Handbook of 2004. Already in 1990, he had drawn attention to it exactly with these words in his article Prolegomena to Prospective Paramyography in Proverbium Yearbook of International Proverb Scholarship, Volume 7. And some of you present here from the very beginning may also remember Wolfgang Mieder's lecture, New Proverbs Run Deep, Prolegomena to a Dictionary of Modern Anglo-American Proverbs at the first interdisciplinary interdisciplinary colloquium on proverbs in 2007 with the result of a so far singular project the dictionary of modern proverbs 2012 compiled by Charles Clay Doyle, Wolfgang Mieder and Fred Shapiro. We'll we will come back to this extraordinary dictionary of proverbs a few more times. Except for a few initial efforts further appeals of a futuristic paramyography and paramyology, a plea for the collection and study of modern proverbs, published several times, seem to have died, um, published several times, seem to have died away more or less unheard so far. And I have to practice myself for what one preaches, had I already announced a lecture entitled Lexikon Moderner Deutscher Sprichwörter, in English, Dictionary of Modern Proverbs at the Conference Eurofras 2012, Maribor, Phrasilogia in Cultura, Phraseology and Culture in the year 2012. Gilt denn der Prophet eigentlich nichts mehr im eigenen Lande? In English, is the prophet without honor in his own country? Wolfgang Mieder may have asked himself from time to time in his German mother tongue. In order to make use of an old proverb from the Bible, 
Matthew 13, 57. No, quite the reverse, one would have to answer him. Not least, his always well-intentioned requests have prompted me to present the project Lexikon Moderner Deutscher Sprichwörter, in short, LMDS, in English Dictionary of Modern German Proverbs, finally here at the 15th Interdisciplinary Colloquium on Proverbs, second Interdisciplinary Colloquium on Proverbs online. Different to modern Anglo-American paramyography, based on a continuous scientific tradition, just to mention the exemplary proverb collections of Nigel Rees, sayings of the century, the stories behind 20th century's quotable sayings, 1984, Bartlett Chair Whiting, Modern Proverbs and Proverbial Sayings, 1989, Wolfgang Miedem and Stuart A. Kingsbury and Kelsey B. Harder, a dictionary of American Proverbs, 1992, Jennifer Speak, the Oxford Dictionary of Proverbs, 5th edition, 2008, and the Dictionary of Modern Proverbs from 2012, with its 1,424 entries, in the meantime increased by a total number of 195 modern Anglo-American proverbs in Proverbium, 33, 2016, 35, 2018, and 37, 2020. The clock of German paramyography seems to have stopped more or less at the end of the 19th century with Karl Friedrich Wilhelm Wanders' five-volume Deutsches Sprichwörter Lexikon, Ein Hausschatz für das deutsche Volk. In English, German Proverb Dictionary, an ancestral treasure for the German people. Edited in the years 1867 to 1880. Special edition of 2007 of the unrevised reprint of 1964. And yet, modern German paramyography is in a more than comfortable position as it can fall back on a considerable number of studies by Wolfgang Mieder on individual proverbs in his German mother tongue, not least coming from his intensive study of modern Anglo-American proverbs, keyword loan proverb. We will come to it back later. In in order to continue establishing the term modern proverb coined by Charles Clay Doyle and Wolfgang Mieder, which describes proverbs that come into existence not earlier than 1900, we've decided to maintain this chronological approach also for the lexicon, uh, for das, for the lexicon Moderne Deutscher Sprichwörter. How to deal with those proverbs which are very likely to appear in the search for modern German ones and date into the period of 1900 and the completion of Karl Friedrich Wilhelm Wander's Deutsches Sprichwörter Lexikon, Ein Hausschatz für das deutsche Volk, whether it is enough for an own proverb dictionary of the last quarter of the 19th century remains to be seen. Be that as it may, back to the actual project of a Lexikon moderner deutscher Sprichwörter. Since its resumption in August this year, the database of potential modern German proverbs, we speak about Sprichwort Kandidaten, in English proverb candidates, has grown steadily and amounts already the impressive number of 748 entries, most of them from the radio and television, or those which suddenly leap to mind in a wide variety of situations and is updated regularly. To the own instinct for proverbs, which each of us has more or less pronounced, and the both already mentioned old mass media, to which the motion picture can be added, belong as a further source for modern proverbs, of course, all forms of modern literature, newspaper and magazines, keyword advertising, as well as the large field of popular music. Also, Oral discourse is by no means to be underestimated with its remarks of single politicians, celebrities, sportmen, etc., 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 which become familiar nowadays much faster, not least because of the new media, such as the internet, Facebook, Twitter, and co. Keyword currency. While age as the second essential marker of a traditional proverb de definition both summarized as the traditionality of a proverb, 
seems to play only a minor role by the modern proverb. Of particular importance are the large electronic full text databases and text corpora, in addition to the more traditional methods of research, like published and archive, archival collections of proverbs. In this regard, my question goes to Wolfgang Mieder whether the database of his close friend Lutz Röhrich in Freiburg, mentioned in his already before quoted article, Prolegomena, Prolegomena to Prospective Paramiography from 1990, still exists, which was used to cre create his magnificent multi-volume lexicon der sprichwörtlichen Redensarten, in English Dictionary of Proverbial Phrases, new edition 2009 of the sixth edition of 2003. And, if so, whether it could be of any use for our project. To come back. I'm thinking first and foremost of the free accessible text corpus. Sorry, I'm thinking first and foremost of the free accessible text corpus, das Deutsche Referenzkorpus, DIRICO. In English, the German Reference Corpus at the Leibniz Institute für Deutsche Sprache in Mannheim. But also, of the student corpus, in English the student corpus of the publisher of the same name, which to my knowledge unfortunately can only be used by its editors. And last but not least, the major search engines such as those of the American technological uh, company Google. The aim of the project Lexicon Moderna Deutscher Sprichwörter is not only to find those proverbs which came into existence after 1900, but also to establish proof of the real currency by as much references as possible out of the sources just mentioned above and, of course, to come as close as possible to the first fixed mentioning their possible origin so that one can speak with complete justification of bona fide modern proverbs. And here it ties up again seamlessly with the exemplary approach of the compilers of the modern of the Dictionary of Modern Proverbs, Charles Clay Doyle, Wolfgang Mieder, and Fred Shapiro. It goes without saying that the modernity of one or the other proverb can be denied by constantly new references, not only during the project itself, but also after its completion, as has been shown not least by the modern Anglo-American proverbs. At the end of my presentation of the project Lexicon Moderna Deutscher Sprichwörter, which is still in, in its initial stage, as I've already mentioned, but now, immerhin aus den Startlöchern, in English at least from the starting blocks, to quote Wolfgang Mieder once more, I'd like to present very briefly at least some modern German proverbs, falling back primarily on individual studies of Wolfgang Mieder, supplemented by some proverb candidates of our constantly growing database. In addition to the already Buff mentioned proverbial advertising slogan, es gibt viel zu tun, packen wir es an, in English, and there's much to do, let's get started, whose already existing paradigm forms, the both anti-proverbs, es gibt viel zu tun, warten wir es ab, in English, there's much to do, let's wait and see, and es gibt viel zu tun, lassen wir es sein, in English, there's much to do, let's let it be, show a more than clear signal for its proverbiality and are treated already themselves as proverb candidates. Could be mentioned as further proverb candidates from the era of advertising Neckermann macht's möglich, in English Neckermann makes it possible, of the former leading mail order trade company in Europe Neckermann, or the advertising slogan 321 Mainz, in English 321 Mine, made famous by the US company eBay one of the world's largest online marketplaces. In addition to the both anti-proverbs just mentioned, there is a number of other proverb candidates, but also such ones of which can already be said to have been established themselves as modern German proverbs, such as Kleider machen Bräute, in English clothes makes brides, and Gelegenheit macht Liebe, in English Opportunity makes love. Anti-proverbs of the both traditional proverbs, Kleider machen Leute, in English clothes make people, and Gelegenheit macht Diebe, in English opportunity makes thieves, respectively. 
Those of you who are able to speak German will of course immedia immediately recognize the rhyme Leute Bräute and Diebe Liebe respectively, which of course was maintained as a proverb marker in both anti-proverbs. At sight of the anti-proverbs can be placed the so-called counter-proverb, a term established by Charles Clay Doyle in 1972. Perhaps not that common as the anti-proverb by Wolfgang Mieder from 1982, which denotes, I quote, simply an overt negation or sententious sounding rebuttal of a proverb, an explicit denial of proverbs asserted truth. As an example of a German counter-proverb, which has become a modern proverb, one could quote, der Klügere gibt nicht nach. In English, the wiser does not give in. The original proverb goes without really have to be mentioned, der Klügere gibt nach. In English, the wiser gives in. Already mentioned was the term loan proverb, with reference to the detailed studies of Wolfgang Mieder, regarding both the modern Anglo-American proverbs and those of his German mother tongue. Only as examples, the both modern proverbs Ein Bild sagt mehr als tausend Worte and Das Gras auf der anderen Seite des Zaunes ist immer grüner should be mentioned. First recorded in German with Wolfgang Mieder in 1975 and 1996 respectively, which have been long translated from the both Anglo-American also modern proverbs One picture is worth a thousand words from 1911 and the grass is or looks greener on the other side of the fence or the road from 1913, respectively. Of course, there's also a not, a not insignificant number of loan translated Anglo-American proverbs which have become modern proverbs and date back already before 1900, such as ein Apfel am Tag or pro Tag hält den Arzt fern, attested in Germany with Wolfgang Mieder since 1990 and existing in America as an apple a day keeps the doctor away already since the end of the 19th century. But, of course, it is not only the Anglo-American proverbs which have become modern German proverbs by loan translation. An interesting case, which absolutely needs to be reopened, as they say in criminology, and what Ösner Ustatucu and I intend to do in the due course is the modern German proverb Die Hunde bellen, aber die Karawane zieht weiter. In English, the dogs bark, but the caravan moves on. To which Wolfgang Mieder, how could it be otherwise, once again dedicated an article. According to him, it is a long translated proverb from Turkish, which was picked up in 1988 by the German Chancellor at that time, Helmut Kohl, the year in which Wolfgang Mieder published his study and found a fast circulation through the media of that time. Not least with the help of the modern media mentioned above, which of course were not available to Wolfgang Mieder at that time and should not belittle his achievements by no means, I think that I can prove this proverb already earlier in the German language. And maybe Ösner Ustatucu and I are able to show its possible origin in the way of his loan and the way of his loan translation with the help of further examples and information a little bit more precisely. We will see. The vast majority of the proverb candidates in the competition for the inclusion in the Lexikon Moderner Deutscher Sprichwörter are, of course, how could it be otherwise, original German proverbs. I have chosen the term competition very deliberately because the era of sports, and from this, in turn, football, hopefully it is not only because I'm interested in it so much, seems to make a not inconsi inconsiderable contribution to it. Worth mentioning are, for example, der Ball ist rund und ein Spiel dauert 90 Minuten. In English, the ball is round and the match lasts 90 minutes. Das nächste Spiel ist immer das schwerste. In English, the next match is always the hardest. Geld schießt keine Tore. In English, money doesn't score goals. Das Runde muss ins Eckige, in English the round, that is the ball, of course, has to go into the square, that is the goal. Or the Pokal hat seine eigenen Gesetze, in English the cup has its own laws. And finally, to stop my presentation by blowing the whistle, nach dem Spiel ist vor dem Spiel. In English, after the match is before the match. 
which was not least after the election to the German Bundestag in September this year, in currency in the variation nach der Wahl ist vor der Wahl. In English, after the election is before the election. Variation as another strong marker of popularity. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the project Lexikon Moderner Deutscher Sprichwörter will go online with its own homepage in the foreseeable future and will have its own Facebook and Twitter accounts which will make it possible for everyone to communicate candidates of modern German proverbs. Es gibt viel zu tun, packen wir es an. Thank you very much for your valued attention. Thank you, Christian, uh, for your uh, very nice and informative overview of this project. Uh, uh, now we have some uh, questions on online. I will read you. Uh, we have a question by Lisa Granbom Heranen, and uh, this is uh, uh, What is the year or point uh, when a German proverb is seen as a modern proverb? Uh, do you know about that? I think you can choose it very freely what to say when it is a modern proverb or not. Um, as I've mentioned in my presentation, we will um, take the same methodology as Wolfgang Mieder and Shapiro and um, Doyle have done and we will, so to say, decide 1900 is the cut we will do for the term of also the modern German proverb, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fionuala, uh, Carlson Williams uh, is asking, um, very pleased uh, to hear about this, Christian, how many instances of each candidate are needed for something uh, to be included in the corpus? <laughs> Yeah, as much many as possible, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe, I, 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 this is what we maybe can ask Wolfgang Mieder, and, and if he's online, how many candidates they have um, taken to say this is a modern proverb or not. Um, I think it's not mentioned in the introduction, um, but I think at a certain point um, we are really able to say this is um, a proverb. Of course, um, we all know what is important to say, what is a proverb. We have spoken about that before. Wolfgang Mieder has given his presentation about structure. We know all the different markers and um, the, the external markers, the internal markers. But what is most important, and I have shown that with the, with the, with the marker of the proverb, um, the variation, for example, is the most important marker of my opinion is the context that makes the proverb too a proverb, may it be a modern proverb, or may it be one of the proverbs I'm working with my PhD, in the ancient Egyptian proverb, and context is in my opinion the most important thing to say this is a proverb or not. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, very well structured, easy to catch up the idea. I really appreciate. Um, you are, uh, you have your your, your uh, thoughts uh, because you get into um, how these proverbs, uh, new proverbs, are emerging uh, and uh, what make uh, the certain narrative with the potential of become a proverb. Uh, you use these words, candidate, mm -hmm. and Professor Mider said, baby proverb. Yeah. <laughs> which I really like. Yeah, so my I question heard it is... for the first time. It's really yes. <laughs> a nice term. Yeah, yeah it's a <laughs> nice term. It's a really yeah. nice term. So uh, my question is, uh, w what do you think... Um, because you mentioned uh, popularity. Currency. Uh, currency yeah. Yes, currency. Yeah. You also said the context. Mm -hmm. How about if we do not only look in the structure um, and in the context, in the, uh, in the, in the, the theme, but also in the user? Maybe that's the user uh, also an uh, interesting point yeah. to assign uh, the potential of the narrative to become narrative. What do you think about yeah. that approach? That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I've not been thinking about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really have to yeah, think, we, we think will, about we will that. Talk yeah. about it. Maybe yeah. not too much time, but. No, yeah. no, but it's really a good idea. I've not been thinking about that also. I have to to, to include the user yeah. within um, yeah, the search for the modern proverb. Yeah. Because we. This is what we can do with modern proverbs. Th this is what we kind of do with the proverbs of the Middle Ages. 
or with my ancient Egyptian proverbs or whatever. Yeah. So it's really a good idea. We'll think about that. Yeah. yeah okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank I, you. I won't leave it with this uh, answer. I will <laughs> later yeah. ask you more. <laughs> Give me a little bit of time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, we have also a question uh, uh, from okay. Sasha Babic. Uh, mm -hmm. Could the traditional proverb also be considered as a modern proverb, especially after some modification? It's also a relevant question mm. again. Yeah, I think I've. Sasha, I think I've touched this in my presentation um, um, when, for example, a um, 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 traditional proverb has its anti-proverbs and these anti-proverbs become, yeah, with their currency, to modern proverbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Lisa's comment also that Peter Zibek uh, used potential proverbs also. Mm, oh thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And uh, two questions from Odi also. How are you going to use crowdsourcing? Also a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And uh, about uh, urban dictionary, do you have in German it also? Once again, uh, uh, urban dictionary, urban, urban. Urban dictionary. Yeah. What, what does it mean, urban dictionary? Maybe, o maybe Odi. You can mm -hmm. detail later. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As a source, I think. Uh. If we have it, I will, mm -hmm. I will use it. Yes, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And have you? Uh, I, I ask by myself also. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, uh, worked already uh, with the structure of this lexicon also, or or it will be future? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, f I think it will be um, mm -hmm. maybe another presentation How in the future. Um, mm -hmm. First, I um, worked and uh, used. Um, just the structure Wolfgang Wiener and the others have done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we have spoken about it. There's also in, in, in Erlangen, there is um, the possibility to study lexicography. And maybe this would also be of interest to work together with them and um, to see if they have um, yeah, suggestions how maybe to construct, not to mm -hmm. say another, sorry Wolfgang, not to say a completely other structure, but if they have good suggestions for, for a dictionary of modern German proverbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the moment, as I said, it's just at the beginning. We are collecting and collecting and collecting, and we we do that with homepage, Facebook, Twitter, and and so on. And then we can think about also about the structure for the dictionary. Mm. Yeah. But I think the structures. This is what I've mentioned already of um, American paramiography. There's really really good work done with this dictionary mentioned, and why not follow them in their work? Yeah. Mm? Danke, danke. But. Uh, if you have more comments, more questions, this is a time <laughs> you can ask and, and to comment, to say. Okay, no questions anymore. You can send anymore. you also German proverbs, can yeah. proverb candidates, of course, no problem. If <laughs> but maybe it's not the audience here for German mm -hmm. proverb candidates here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, thank you once more, and uh, I, I think that we can, you deserve uh, another applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And uh, we uh, move on with uh, online, yeah? Online uh, speakers. And uh, our uh, second speaker, uh, let me introduce uh, our second speaker today, is uh, Glauner Silva Pele. Pele Pereira from Brazil, independent researcher from Brazil, and um, he will speak uh, about the proverbs, virtue, and happiness. Please, you are welcome. Oh, please switch microphone in. Yes. Thank you. I I will speak in Portuguese. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. As minhas mais cordiais saudações às senhoras e senhores participantes deste significativo colóquio. Cumprimento o doutor é, Rui João Batista Soares, digníssimo presidente da Associação Internacional de Paremiologia. 
já somos amigos. E tudo começou por causa da publicação do meu modesto livro A Virtude é a Origem de Toda a Felicidade. O título é um provérbio alemão é, e trata da promoção das virtudes e da felicidade através dos provérbios. Os provérbios ensinam. É, os nove primeiros capítulos do livro formam uma espécie de teoria do provérbio. E eu gosto particularmente de uma que fala dos provérbios segundo eles próprios. Procuramos fazer uma sistematização de provérbios sobre provérbios de vários pontos deste mundo de Cristo, começando por Portugal, Espanha, Itália, Alemanha, é, e elaboramos uma teoria proverbial dos provérbios. É, e um dos capítulos do livro trata mais especificamente do título do livro e desta comunicação. A felicidade, os provérbios, a felicidade, as virtudes, felicidades e provérbios, com essa relação. Isso não é um tema ingênuo, como podem pensar pessoas não afeitas aos provérbios. A relação dos provérbios com a felicidade não é, é sem propósito, é, sem fundamento, mas tem um profundo lastro filosófico e histórico é, sobre o uso dos provérbios para é, promover a felicidade. É uma grande honra para mim participar deste evento. Eu gostaria de começar com uma palavra a Portugal, país é, amado, que eu tive a oportunidade de visitar uma vez só, por enquanto, é, de Lisboa até Santarém, depois Coimbra, depois Porto, em outra feita, fui até Covilhã e Belmonte. É, inesquecível aquela viagem. É, sirvo me das palavras de Camões, glória portuguesa, para exaltar a pequena casa lusitana, que foi tão capaz e tão grande em seus feitos marítimos que, como diz o poeta, se mais mundo houvera, Portugal lá chegara. Minha homenagem a Portugal, cuja história nos ensina por outro de seus destacados poetas, Fernando Pessoa, que não custa pouco o que é esplêndido. Disse ele, quem quer passar além do bojador, tem que passar além da dor. É, com o mesmo espírito, nos instrui o magnífico provérbio português. A virtude não seria virtude se não nos custasse esforço. Se nós não nos esforçarmos em nenhuma direção, a nossa vida vira um caos. Nós temos que diariamente organizar a nossa vida, corrigir os nossos erros, é, polir as nossas virtudes, é, se queremos ser felizes. Porque o vício ou a ausência de virtude só encaminha para a penúria. A virtude é custosa. É, minha homenagem a Portugal, que brilha no alto do índice global da paz o que é uma virtude de grande honra e distinção para um país. Creio eu que, nos últimos poucos anos, Portugal está em terceiro lugar no ranking dos países é, do Índice Global da Paz. Desejo a Portugal e ao Brasil, naturalmente, que está tão desorientado. Desejo a Portugal todos os progressos que o país julga é, precisar e deseja, por mais difíceis que pareçam. É, retomo o poeta, o grande Camões, para dizer a Portugal de hoje. Avante, Lusíadas, impossibilidades não façais, e quem quis sempre pôde. E que Portugal consiga 
maiores progressos é, como merece e como deseja. Vamos falar, então, sobre os provérbios, a virtude e a felicidade. Eu vou citar o grande gênio da música, grande gênio alemão da música clássica, Beethoven, que assim falou sobre a virtude. Só ela pode fazer alguém feliz. Não o dinheiro. Falo por experiência. Beethoven. Em 6 de outubro de 1802, Beethoven escreveu uma carta-testamento para os seus dois irmãos, na qual ele deu este expressivo e significativo conselho. Recomendem a virtude aos seus filhos. Só ela pode fazer alguém feliz, não o dinheiro. Falo por experiência. Foi ela que me levantou da miséria. E Beethoven declarou algo que é, aprecio de modo especial. Ele disse, eu fui educado com provérbios. Eu fui educado com provérbios. E isso nós podemos é, é, constatar no livro de estudos de composição que ele escreveu para um discípulo, no qual, ao rodapé de páginas, de partes difíceis do estudo, ele usa provérbios para motivar o seu aluno. Provérbios sobre é, o querer e poder, sobre que as coisas lustrosas são difíceis, sobre que não se deve perder nenhum dia sem aprender alguma coisa. E ele diz, nenhum dia sem uma linha, que é um provérbio da antiguidade latina. Então, ele foi educado com provérbios e educou com provérbios. Quem quiser ser feliz na aquisição de uma habilidade, de aprender um ofício, um novo idioma, é nenhum dia sem uma linha. Então, nesse sentido da felicidade, do crescimento pessoal, o que faz o, o, o compositor? Usar provérbios para motivar o seu aluno. Está aí, por exemplo, um exemplo prático de provérbios encaminhando para a felicidade da realização é, pessoal. Eu acho que já bastaria é, falar sobre isso, né? Colocar os provérbios a serviço da verdade, a serviço da virtude, da sabedoria e, consequentemente, da felicidade. Sem virtude não há felicidade. Isso é matemática. É essa a mensagem também de Aristóteles, em sua ética a Nicômaco. Disse o filósofo, será feliz a vida conduzida de acordo com a virtude? Será feliz? a vida conduzida de acordo com a virtude. Cícero substitui, é, sustentou que a glória segue a virtude como sombra. A virtude vai na frente e vai rebocando a glória. A glória é uma função, uma consequência, um fruto da virtude. É... E poderíamos substituir a felicidade segue a virtude como sombra. É, e diz a Chat na tragédia de Dom, de Jean-Jacques Lefranc, a glória jamais está onde a virtude não está. E nesse meu modesto livro, eu apresento outros provérbios em que a virtude e a felicidade são, respectivamente, causa e efeito. Virtude, causa da felicidade. Por exemplo, um provérbio galês diz a virtude é a mãe de toda a felicidade. Um provérbio em inglês também. Virtude e felicidade são mãe e filha. Diz um outro alemão. Sem virtude, nenhuma felicidade. Outro alemão. Quem se afasta da virtude, se afasta de sua felicidade. Agora, um outro que é Tâmil, lá da Índia, 
Aquilo é felicidade que brota da virtude. E agora vem dois outros, respectivamente, chinês e inglês, que eu admiro muito. Nós estamos falando, antes de entrar nos provérbios, na relação de provérbios e felicidade, estamos falando de virtude e felicidade. É, esses dois são muito bonitos e inspirativos, poéticos. O, o, o provérbio chinês diz, a virtude é o fundamento da felicidade. O vício, o presságio da miséria. Em inglês, se você pode estar bem sem saúde, você pode estar feliz sem virtude. É, aquelas frases dos pensadores antigos chegaram a um provérbio alemão que é a honra é a sombra da virtude e um outro latino, a virtude gera glória. A, a, e, esses dois provérbios agora, Portugal contribui com este. Quem semeia virtudes, colhe glória. E agora vem um alemão e um dinamarquês, respectivamente, que são muito poéticos e usam uma linguagem religiosa para a relação entre a virtude e a honra. Diz o provérbio alemão, através do templo da virtude para o templo da honra. E o dinamarquês, quem quiser entrar no templo da honra deve primeiro passar pelo templo da virtude. Agora nós vamos passar mais especificamente para a relação dos provérbios e a virtude que está intimamente ligada à felicidade, à virtude, à sabedoria, à honra, à honestidade, etc. A relação dos provérbios. Por que os provérbios são um, um instrumento de escolha para a promoção da virtude e, consequentemente, para alimentar a felicidade? É, um provérbio inglês especialíssimo diz todo o bom senso do mundo corre para os provérbios. Todo o bom senso do mundo se proverbializa. E, como não é possível ser feliz sem bom senso, o provérbio está aí como ferramenta para promover a sabedoria, a sensatez e, consequentemente, a felicidade. É... Na fábula Os Dois Ferradores, a escritora espanhola Concepción Arenal de Carrasco diz... E por que ela diz? Porque os, é... a sensatez, o bom senso, corre para os provérbios. Só que a insensatez, o vício, a tolice, também querem se promover pelo meio proverbial. Há muitos provérbios tolos. É, justamente porque o provérbio é uma ferramenta maravilhosa de comunicação para instilar bons conceitos e, e veicular conclusões. É, então, e nós não vamos demonizar ou desprezar toda a categoria do provérbio, todo o gênero, por causa dos mau uso. O provérbio eh, latino diz: o uso não precisa tolher, perdão, o abuso não precisa tolher o uso. Nós temos, então, é que é, olhar para os provérbios com uma, com uma visão crítica, para saber se ele é sensato. E como lidar com essa diferença? entre os provérbios sábios e os provérbios tolos. Então, Concepcion Arenal de Carrasco diz, quer dizer, quem diz, na verdade, é o Pedro, que é um personagem é, do conto Os Dois Ferradores. Diz para Pedro, quando o provérbio é prudente, eu, como ninguém, o aprecio. Mas, do que é imprudente, bonitamente me rio. Bonitamente mesmo. Ah, eu não sei se é conhecido em Portugal ou se é coisa só aqui do Brasil, coisa de carioca, eu não sei. Mas é, as, muitos estudantes falam na escola quem não copia as, que, as respostas do colega na prova não sai da escola. né? Quem não cola não sai da escola. Ainda vem rimado para promover, pra, pra, pra promover a tolice da desonestidade, do não aprender e copiar. 
Quando o provérbio é, bonito, é prudente, eu, como ninguém, o aprecio. Mais do que a imprudente, bonitamente me rio. É, os provérbios, segundo o professor Jean-Louis Lauan, que é professor da Universidade de São Paulo, de origem libanesa, ele escreveu algumas obras em língua portuguesa sobre a relação do provérbio da sabedoria com a felicidade. E ele chega a dizer que a desorientação da pós-modernidade tem a ver com a perda no Ocidente das raízes proverbiais. Lauan chega a falar isso. A desorientação do Ocidente bebe na perda da, das raízes proverbiais, na perda da sabedoria. Uh, provérbios antigos falam, você quer ser feliz, quer viver bem, com saúde? Deite cedo, acorde cedo. E, e hoje nós vemos aqui a, a juventude dormindo é, em horas muito tardias à noite porque estão usando o celular, o WhatsApp, para conversar com colegas. Quando à noite nós precisamos do escuro para a produção da melatonina, que é o hormônio do sono, que depende exatamente do escuro. A melatonina é produzida pelo estímulo do escuro. E a pessoa vai deitar com o um celular e, e a, a, a radiação da, da, da luz do celular ou computador é, con, é, é contraria a necessidade do organismo da produção de melatonina. E daí é, vem distúrbios do sono, distúrbios do humor, depressão, etc. Quer ser feliz? Quer viver com saúde? Deita, deite cedo e levante cedo. E por aí vai. Mas os provérbios são coletivamente uma estratégia Estratégico manual, informal e aberto de sabedoria, abrangente, objetivo e de fácil acesso. É, Wolfgang Mida escreveu, Wolfgang Mida. Os provérbios satisfazem a necessidade humana de resumir experiências e observações em pepitas de sabedoria. O provérbio é uma riqueza. Uma riqueza que atravessa séculos e milênios. A literatura escrita mais antiga conhecida é dos sumérios. E nessa literatura, muito, dessa literatura, muito é provérbio. Já na antiguidade, já os sumérios é, usavam os provérbios para dar conselhos. E eu fiz um apanhado desses conselhos, de alguns deles, e pus no capítulo do meu livro também. Se é que o livro possa interessar alguém, ele está disponível na Amazon, na forma de Kindle, e-book. Né? Eu ainda não consegui o um meio de é, oferecê-lo impresso em Portugal, mas gostaria de ter essa, esse privilégio. Mas o nome do livro, A Virtude é a Origem de Toda a Felicidade, a versão é, digital está é, disponível para vocês em qualquer lugar do mundo. Né? Então, como diz Miriam, é pepita de sabedoria. Nós precisamos sintetizar o conhecimento, passar uma palavra fácil. Vou dar um exemplo. Uma vez eu estava fazendo alguma coisa que não era muito sensata e a minha mãe, saudosa, falou para mim, quem volta, não, quem anda para trás não erra caminho. Tem uma outra versão que diz, quem volta não erra caminho. É um provérbio fluminense, que é aqui do estado do Rio, no Brasil. É, quem anda para trás não erra caminho. Isto é, quem é, para, reconsidera, se arrepende e volta, ele vai agora para o caminho correto. Então, quem anda para trás, quem tem humildade para voltar, não erra caminho. Isso me trouxe felicidade, me trouxe sabedoria, me fez repensar e passar de uma insensatez que eu cometesse para uma, sensata, uma coisa sensata é, que a substituísse é, justamente pela sua sabedoria mas Salomão, o maior gênio da história 
qual foi o instrumento principal desse sábio para comunicar verdades, para instruir na boa moral, etc. O provérbio. Então, vamos nos passos do sábio. Justamente pela sabedoria, ele elegeu o gênero do provérbio para ensinar virtudes. David Bland escreveu, a fim de levar a carga de instruções da sabedoria, os sábios dependiam pesadamente da qualidade robusta do provérbio. O provérbio se tornou o um instrumento de escolha para o sábio. E agora, olha só. É, falamos dessa relação né, da, da virtude como causa da felicidade. E agora vamos falar sobre os provérbios como instrumento de promoção da virtude. Consequentemente, os provérbios e a felicidade. Diz o provérbio indiano. Quem conhece bem os provérbios pode sair de quase toda dificuldade. Um outro que é russo prega. Ao dizer o provérbio, você mostra o caminho. Com o ditado, você consola a alma. Um outro hebraico. Uma pessoa pode entender as coisas profundamente através dos provérbios. Entender é também um fator gerador de felicidade, conhecer, discernir. Um outro russo, gosta muito desse, provérbio, um assistente em todas as ações. Para qualquer coisa que eu vá fazer, tem um provérbio ali para me orientar. É... De Portugal. Esse aqui eu aprendi com o doutor Rui. É, eu não achei... Eu não achei... Fácil, não. Eu não tinha achado, não tinha lido, mas ele me, me ensinou esse aqui. Ó. Para cada ocasião, tenha um provérbio sempre à mão. Maravilha, né? Para cada é, ocasião, para, você, para, para, para ser feliz naquela decisão, naquele ato, tenha um provérbio sempre à mão. Da Espanha vem, para todo mal, um provérbio. E para tudo bem, também. Da Rússia, ah, já falei, esse provérbio com assistente em todas as ações. Da Espanha, novamente, não há conselheiro mais certeiro que o refraneiro. Provérbio e felicidade. O, 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 o provérbio aconselha. E o conselho pretende a felicidade. Francês. Esse aqui é bem direto. Se algum dia estiveres inquieto, procura um bom conselho nos provérbios. Ah... Outro espanhol. Ah, quantos, quantos dirão, recordando o estado de aflição em que se viram, se eu soubesse esse provérbio. Teria sido feliz, né? Esse é espanhol. É... Hebraico. Esse é forte. A vida de um homem é muitas vezes construída sobre um provérbio. A vida de um homem é muitas vezes construída sobre um provérbio. Eu poderia dizer que eu nunca mais me esqueci do provérbio que a minha mãe me disse. Então, hoje, quando eu vou fazer alguma coisa, aquilo vem à cabeça. Quem anda para trás não erra caminho. Então, eu volto é, do risco para a segurança, por exemplo. Né? E eu vou me encaminhar para o encerramento é, apresentando aos ilustres ouvintes, algo que escreveu Francisco Rodrigues Marim, um dos maiores eruditos espanhóis do provérbio. Como descansa o fatigado ânimo do homem quando, depois de vacilar algum tempo entre as névoas da dúvida, acha um sábio provérbio que, como tocha refugente, lhe mostra o caminho e o aparta do abismo em que esteve a ponto de despenhar-se. Olha como ele chama a paremiologia, ou paremiografia, os provérbios, o conjunto de provérbios. Ó código sublime, onde a consciência universal estampou seus preceitos em frases poéticas e em fórmulas breves. Em ti, acha consolo triste. Decisão, 
o resoluto. Paciência, o desesperado. Correção, o vicioso. Purismo e graça, o literato. O homem da ciência, luminosos aforismos. E todos, ensino agradável e saudável. Que és livro aberto a todos os olhares e sabe a resolução a todos os problemas. Sucede às vezes, muitas vezes, que desconhecemos o provérbio em que está contido o conselho de que se necessita para se resolver a executar um ato, para adotar uma determinação. Mas, por isso, temos que crer que provérbio não existe? Então, Rodrigues Marim conclui, Busque-se bem, e se achará. O código proverbial geral é completíssimo. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Obrigada. And uh, now, again, is time for questions, for comments, if you have we have four minutes. Obrigado, Laura, uh, por esta belíssima apresentação. Uh, queria apenas referir duas ou três curiosidades. Uh, uma delas tem a ver com o facto de que fez aí uma viagem proverbial muito grande passando por provérbios provenientes de vários países. De entre eles, tomei nota de que a maioria eram de origem alemã. Pode explicar-me essa razão? Ficaria grato. Obrigado. Assim, é interessante. Quando eu comecei a fazer essa a pesquisa para o livro... É, o maior impulso veio de Portugal e da Espanha. É, até pela, pelo meu pouco acesso à língua alemã, eu, eu demorei mais a chegar aos provérbios alemães. Mas, quando cheguei, fiquei encantado, porque eles têm alguns dos mais finos provérbios é, do mundo. Então, não foi uma escolha... É, eu, eu, eu queria até fazer isso com o Brasil, mas eu desconheço no Brasil qualquer provérbio sobre provérbio. Então, vamos para Portugal, Espanha, foi onde eu é, me decantei mais. Então, essa escolha para alemã, essa, essa ênfase na, nos provérbios alemães, não foi deliberada, não. Aconteceu. Eu encontrei é, provérbios, talvez mais do que outra língua, ou ou entre as, as principais, que fizeram de pensamentos filosóficos antigos provérbios. Né? Alguns provérbios alemães bebem direto na antiguidade latina e grega. Mas não é muito diferente também com Portugal, Espanha, Itália, França. Né? Em outras partes do livro nós vamos encontrar uma ênfase mais em provérbios franceses, porque o tema do capítulo é, foi mais abordado pela é, paremiologia é, francesa. Então, foi acidental, foi a, na, a mera questão de fato, né? não nenhuma escolha deliberada. Meu nome é alemão, né? vocês sabem, meu nome é era alemão. E aí, quando eu, é, eu não sei onde a minha mãe arranjou isso, porque Glauner é um nome... É, é, é alemão, mas eu não tenho nada de alemão, nada de alemão. Mas o sobrenome é da Silva Pereira, então não soa muito bem, né? fica meio desconcertante, né? mas da Alemanha você tem um nome mesmo. É admiração pela literatura. Thank you, thank you once time. And we don't have uh, comments and questions this time online, so we move on. Thank you. And we will move uh, to Africa. Uh, next uh, 
presentation will be presented by Charles Aqua Mazango and uh, Stella Emade Nge uh, from the University of Cape Town, Cape Town. And uh, the presentation is called Does Indigenous Proverb Infuse Fear When Attached to an African Traditional Event? Some Bakosi Indigenous Proverbs of Cameroon. Please. Thank you. Uh, hello? Hello. Can you get hello. me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, great. Um, I'm glad all is really going according to plan. Um, I'm so happy to see that hall where when things used to gloom, we used to all come together there and express what we call proverbs. The beautiful city of Tavira, beautiful country of Portugal, unfortunately, the COVID-19 is trying to bring down that little beautiful city and country. But we are all hoping that things will come to normality soon. Professor Sauris, Mrs. Marinella, thanks very much for keeping the candle burning. You are on board, and we all appreciate all you're doing to keep us, you know, together in this big family that you created in Tavira, Portugal. Please, family, colleagues, accept warm greetings from Africa, and especially from the beautiful country of South Africa, and especially from Cape Town, where I'll be reporting. Unfortunately, my wife, Stella, who was supposed to be presenting with me, was called up this afternoon for other duties. And as you know, as a scholar, she can't refuse attending to pressing needs of the university. Notwithstanding, she sends her regards and I'm going to be talking on her behalf as well. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this little talk that I will be giving to you all today. And today we will be looking at whether indigenous proverbs infuse fear when attached to an African traditional event, and as the say goes, we'll be looking at the Bakosi proverbs of Cameroon. The presentation will take this format. We'll be looking at research question, the rationale for the research question, Rationale for the use of proverbs within African traditional events, such as dance. The Bakosi proverbs that may and may not infuse fear when glued to an African traditional Ahon dance. Possible reasons why indigenous proverbs infuse fear when glued to an African traditional event, such as the Bakosi Ahon dance possible measures through which this fearsome element may be overcome. And ladies and gentlemen, learned colleagues will come to a conclusion. I'll start by looking at the research question. I always say, if there is no research question, there is no paper. Hence, this paper will be looking at or questioning whether indigenous proverbs may infuse fear when fixed to an African traditional event, such as dance. Why do I say this? Following that African traditional events that evolve dance encompass esoteric and non-esoteric epistemology. Proverbs, the rationale for the research question continues Proverbs have great. Now the rationale for the research question, sorry. 
Rationale for the research question stem from the fact that proverbs in Africa serve as advice, reproach, warning, encouragement, and further explanation of some facts. Proverbs have great value and importance, such as giving a sense of identity, community, culture, respect for authority and elders, secretness of everything under the sun and sense of hospitality and others. What then is the rationale for the use of proverbs within African traditional events? We've seen the research question and we've seen the raison d'etre for asking this research question. Scholars have spoken. Because scholars have spoken, we are going to examine this. Among the rationale for the use of proverbs within African traditional events is that proverbs are to teach and educate the audience as they disclose how to treat or relate with people. Another rationale is that proverbs have continued to play prominent roles in secret and secular events of people. Again, proverbs are ways that Africans showcase their cultural heritage and uniqueness. I hope we are together as I'm going along and uniqueness. I don't know, I can't see very well. Now, following that African proverbs have a good reason, attracted considerable attention from scholars qualifies proverbs to be used within African traditional events. Since African proverbs again are used to focus on the values of the African society this furthermore qualifies it to be used within African traditional events. Again, we are told that since Africans try to express the wealth of philosophy, wisdom, and events as they affect and control their communities through proverbs, thus qualifies it to be used within an African traditional event. Another rationale is because proverbs form a mnemonic device in societies in which everything worth knowing and relevant to day-to-day -to -day life has to be committed to memory. Now, having looked at that, we now go forward to advance Bacossi proverbs that may and may not infuse fear when glued to an African traditional dance. And when we look, talk of African traditional dance, we are looking at the Bacossi Ahon dance. Bacossi proverbs, otherwise known as Ngan Ekose in Bakosi, language encompass prideful elements that are considered esoteric when glued to a traditional dance such as the Ahon Bakosi dance. Unfortunately, since the guru, that's my wife, Stella, who is well versed in these proverbs, is unfortunately not around, please. Colleagues, you will excuse my tongue because I won't really be able to go through this Bakosi proverbs. If she were here, she could have been the real person to go through it. Because of that, I'm going to be going straight onto the English translation of the proverbs. Hence, I'll look at a proverb, for example, the proverb that says, in the English language, if a man does not understand the language of a drum, he says the drum is making noise.
Sorry, I'm interrupting you. We don't hear. Sorry, are Switch you not getting microphone me? in. Yeah. Now we hear. Thank you. Okay, I'm on now. Yeah. Okay. So Everything where did you okay. stop getting me? Now it's okay again. Can I continue? Yeah, you can continue. Everything is now. okay now. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, great. Now, the origin of this proverb is that of old, people understood the language of the drum, but for those who didn't understand it, it was merely a gun. This proverb in the Bakosi language means that if you don't understand something, you don't appreciate its value. Only members of the Ahon dance appreciate the value and language of the drum when it exposes the esoteric elements of the, of the dance. Meaning that this Ahon dance has both esoteric and non esoteric elements. When the beatings of the drum go out, when the beatings now shows the esoteric aspect, not everyone understands that it is now in the esoteric sphere of the dance. Onlookers will just look at it and just say, well, this drum is making noise, but those who are dancing, those who are in that court, understands very well that now the beating is evoking the esoteric element of their dance. So, since Africans express the, I don't know, I'm a bit dragging here. The origin of this proverb is that of old. Okay, I've already said this. So I have to go on to the next slide. This proverb in the Bakosi language means that people of the family, another Bakosi proverb that encompass a dreadful element is the one that says that the bitter cola nut does not have lobs. The bitter cola does not have lobs. Unfortunately, I am not there, Tavira, because I was thinking that this uh, talk, when I'm coming to give this talk, I'll bring the bitter cola and the cola nut to show my colleagues and my family members the difference between a cola nut and a bitter cola. Unfortunately, I'm not there, but well, we'll meet. And when we do, I hope I'll come with some cola nuts and uh, bitter colas to show you people the difference. Now, the bitter cola does not have lobs. The origin of this proverb is that the bitter cola is whole, thus do, does not have natural splits, as for example, the cola nut does. This proverb in the Bakosi language means that people of one family or group do things as one. It is expected that members of the same group, such as the Bakosi Ahon group, do things as one. Being members of the same group, they are expected to react in the same manner when the beating of the drum evokes the esoteric aspect of the group. Those who do not understand the esoteric aspect may simply say the drum is making noise as they don't understand the Ahon group and the sacredness that it carries. However, there are non-dreadful proverbs as well that may not infuse fear when glued to the Bakosi Ahon dance. I've given you two examples of those proverbs that carry fearful elements. Now let's look at those proverbs that don't have these dreadful elements in the Ahon traditional dance. The proverb that says, when a drum dis is displaced, 
it also changes its sound. The origin of this proverb is that when the position of a drum is changed, the sound of the drum also changes. The sound of the drum also changes. This proverb in the Bakosi language means that the further the time lapse from an event, the more difficult the situation becomes to be handled. This proverb does not evoke the esoteric nature of the Ahon Bakosi dance. It simply says, when the people beating the drums change position of the drum, the sound of the drum changes as well. Another on non-dreadful Bakosi proverb is the one that says, large, round, edible fruit has fallen from a tree, but it hasn't jumped. The origin of this proverb is that when an edible fruit falls from a tree, it lies in the same spot long before it gets bad. This proverb, this proverb in the Bakosi language means that you might miss, you might have missed an opportunity, but is still within your reach. This proverb may be evoked when, for example, a person watching the Ahon dance fails to see a particular gesture that had been demonstrated by, by the dancers because of being absent-minded. This person can still see this gesture if he or she is not absent-minded because the dancers are still dancing. This proverb does not infuse fear as it relates to the overt act of the Ahon dance. Possible reasons why indigenous proverbs infuse fear when glued to an African traditional event such as dance. We've seen two uh, proverbs that infuse fear and two that doesn't infuse fear. Now, what are these possible reasons that makes these indigenous proverbs infuse fear when it is glued to an African traditional event such as dance. Possible reasons why these proverbs may infuse fear when glued to an African traditional event such as the Bakosi Ahom dance is because it embraces spiritual elements that have been considered secret since time immemorial and recognized by the community. This proverb in the Bakosi language means, no, well, I've gone back again. Unfortunately, I'm telling, I'm having some problems with my sight. Sorry for that. Now, the proverb infuse fear when glued to an African tradition. Another reason, furthermore, proverbs infuse fear when glued to an African traditional event, such as the Bakosi Ahon dance, because the secret elements are not revealed to non-members of the group for fear that it will forfeit its value. Now, possible measures through which the fearsome elements may be overcome. The fear that is glued to the Bakosi traditional Ahon dance may be overcome when the esoteric elements referred to in the dance are made public and put in a literary form. The literary appearance may either be presented in a print or digital format, as it is generally accepted that one kind of literary presented work cannot, com cannot be completely replaced by another, not even when they have a common basis. Following that the esoteric element of the dance is not in the public domain and not in literary form, 
The person who reveals the esoteric element of the dance puts it in a literary form, automatically owns copyright of what has been put in the literary form. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, by concluding, I'm saying here that notwithstanding that there are proverbs that may infuse fear when attached to an African traditional dance, such as the Bakosi Ahon traditional dance, it is worth saying that fear, the fear issue, is only attached to those proverbs that encompass esoteric elements. Once the esoteric element is put, is placed in a literary form, the person who does so automatically owns copyright of the work because copyright belongs to the person who really puts forth the work. When pen goes on paper, automatically copyright prevails. And I'm saying here, for those of us who are yet to come and visit the beautiful city of Tavira. We've always been coming. We are longing to come. The COVID has come, but we know it's soon going out. I am sending out this message. And this should be clear, clear understanding among those who are to join us as new members and those who are still there as old members, while hoping that we meet again next year and this time not online, but presently because I'm seeing some of our members there in the beautiful city and in that our famous hall, it is worth knowing that for an X-ray into Proverbs, please tell those who are yet to be members of our association that they should visit Hotel Villa Gala, Hotel Villa Gali, in Tavira every November, and they will be able to be exposed to the X-ray into Proverbs. Thanks very much. You are most welcome, colleagues, family. Let's have questions, and let's see how we're going to open up on the questions or remarks that you learned colleagues have for us. Thanks very much, waiting to hear from you people. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. And uh, I see here online uh, some questions already. Fionola Carson Williams uh, from Ireland I, I, saying, thank you, Charles. Are these proverbs used in other contexts apart from Ahon, Ahon dance? Well, really, they might be used in other contexts because you know proverbs have different meanings. The way one proverb can be interpreted in different forms. Now I am looking at these proble proble uh, proverbs in the context of the Bakose Ahon dance. Other scholars might also be looking at these proverbs in their own context and trying to interpret it in that context. I'm doing this following a specific aspect, dance, and I've taken to one really uh, uh, unique dance of the Bakosi people. Next year, I'm putting forward another paper that I'm going to be looking at another aspect of this Bakosi traditional dance. And this now is no more going to be the one that, only, that produces the esoteric and non-esoteric elements but only stricto sensu, the esoteric elements. Now, in this Ahon dance, there is a difference. There are non-members who can really see the dancers do their thing. But the next paper that is coming up, I'm almost done with that paper as well. I'm looking at another sort of dance that even the, it's, only meant for members of that group. Non-members are not allowed to come and see. And even if you peep and try to say you are trying to go through to see what is happening in the dance, it is a taboo and really you can be cursed. 
This is all in the Bakosi tradition. What I'm trying to do here is trying to bring forth some of the aspects that are in Africa that needs to be exploited to see why certain aspects are considered esoteric and others non-esoteric. But for the person who asked that question, yes, you can interpret this in your own way and see how it fits, because proverbs can be interpreted in one way. I hope I've answered that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, a question uh, by Odi Lauhakangas. And how does fear be expressed? How does it manifest? <laughs> fear? Well, so many people have different ways of manifesting fear. There are some people who are strong, and when they face is uh, issues where there is fear, you will hardly see, you know, on their faces. Their expressions might show that, yes, there is the fearsome element that is here. Now, when I refer this to the Ahon dance, the exoteric element, you onlookers who are seeing these people dance, you don't know when the exoteric element is being interpreted in the beatings of the drum because you are not a member. Um, for those of us, look, I've already written this paper. You will see in my writing, I am equating this esoteric element to things like the Freemason in Europe. If you are a member or if you are not a member of the Freemason, you don't understand what it means if at all certain signals are given out. It's only when you become a member that you understand. And if you are not an, a member, you cannot be told what is inside. It's just, I'm just trying to now equate it to what is happening in Europe. Because if I say, as the way I'm putting it, it might give people problems understanding it. But in the paper, the write-up that I have done, I've really equated it to the Freemason in Europe so as to at least open up the minds of scholars who are not in Africa. Thank you again. Uh, more comments, uh, questions? So uh, it seems that uh, there is no comments and questions. So uh, today is St. Martin's Day, but uh, today is uh, also a very, very special day because Charles has an anniversary. It's my birthday. Yes, <laughs> Charles' <laughs> birthday. So yes. uh, organizers have prepared you a surprise, and we will. Happy birthday to you. Oh God. Felicidades, muitos anos de vida. Hoje é dia de festa. Cantam as nossas almas para o menino Charles. Uma salva de palmas. Oh, thank you. Happy very birthday. Much, my Happy family. birthday. I wish I were I were there with you people. You always give me this nice looking and everything on this birthday. I quite remember the last one I spent in Portugal, in Tavira, where Prof. Saures, Marilene, Marinella, and the other colleagues, you know, gave me a wonderful birthday present. I look forward to next year. Next year. Let's keep our fingers crossed for us to come back as one as we normally do in Tavira. Please, God save all of you. Stay well and be comforted. Everything will be fine. Thank you very much. Stay healthy also. And uh, we will celebrate, celebrate your birthday during our coffee break. So thank you all for this uh, very wonderful session. And uh, let's continue with coffee break. Thank you, Charles, once more, and happy, happy birthday, and see you, and stay healthy. Thank you very, Sunny very much. Sunny proverbial greetings Same. from Tavira. Thank you very much. Same with you, people.
Bye.
Hello everybody, uh, excuse this uh, delay, uh, we are uh, trying to connect with our colleague in Argentina, but some problems with the connection, so we begin with the, the presentation that Maribel uh, sent to us. Uh, so I ask your permission to begin because we are delayed, so let's begin. Uh, para todos que estão aqui na sala, como já compreenderam, estamos a tentar resolver um problema de ligação com a Maribel, mas não se consegue, então por isso mesmo vamos começar a sessão baseado no ficheiro que deixou para nós. Então... Aqui estou. Há este... áudio? Estoy acá. Buenas tardes, Maribel. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Sí. Uh, excuse this delay, but really everybody is waiting for you, so if you are in in position to present it will be very much uh, grateful for you. Please, go ahead. Quedo a la espera de lo que ustedes resuelvan. Voy a apagar el celular. Estoy, eh, estoy en conexión. Eh, yo estoy esperando que tú leas el trabajo, eh, Rui. Estoy... ¿Quieres que diga francés? Yo me escucho. Yo prefiero si te puedo leer el trabajo. Pour moi, c'est la mieux. Je ne sais pas bien, je ne vais pas dormir pendant tout le temps. Pendant 42 heures, je suis très, très fatiguée. Et si tu es d'accord, tu peux lire le les travail pour moi. Je, je les remercie infiniment. Uh, if, uh, you, if you can present, uh, go ahead. If not, Just, uh, are you past the few minutes that you sent to us? Are you hearing me? Uh, no, I prefer to make the things easier possible. So, we have the few minutes that you sent to us. So, we can pass them, okay? Je, je peux parler en français et non, non, non. ce n'est pas la langue de... de non, je peux, en espagnol, euh, jamais. Et je préfère que si, si quelqu'un peut lire les, les travails. Marie, et je peux répondre à, à quelques demandes. Oui. Maribel, uh, excuse-moi, mais oui. you, you know que les langues sont anglais et portugais. So you have prepared your few minutes, so we'll pass the few minutes because we are delayed, okay? D'accord, d'accord. Okay. Estoy de acuerdo. Okay. okay.
this proverb is very important. Uh, we passed all your few minutes here and uh, naturally if you can uh, give the summary of your presentation please go ahead and uh, all of us are listening you Can you explain? Are you I'm hearing sorry. me? No, we are not hearing you, Maribel. Some, uh, some problems on the connection. So maybe we saw your face. We know how difficult is these times for you. Uh, but I think that everybody understand these difficulties. So I must thank you so much, Maribel. And uh, next time it will be better, okay? I think that everybody around the world listening uh, or trying to listening this presentation from Maribel understand that uh, their own conditions 
uh, are not the best because uh, they have some problems, unfortunately, with our dear friend and uh, her husband. Uh, so uh, it was impossible to make uh, this connection, maybe by some difficulties on his computer. She said that didn't receive our links, but we sent all the links for her by different vias. So uh, I think that everybody can understand. Even here in the room at the Vira, uh, all people understand that with these difficulties, it's better to stop and we are passing to next speaker. Please, Fernanda. Over? Over. Uh, ok. Um, isto agora é a hora de contar histórias. Portanto, this is the, the, the hour of the storyteller. Ok? I'm going to speak about Tavira and the names of the river and etc. And some places. But I will speak in Portuguese. Um, Ai, sou eu. Uh, dividi isto em capítulos. Uh, tem que ser aqui? Ah, que chatice, eu acho que andar de um lado para o outro. Tenho aqui. Ah, ok. Ok. Dividi isto em capítulos. Portanto, e comecei, o primeiro capítulo foi o que o Rui me pediu. Os nomes. Portanto, vamos falar dos nomes. Mas... Uh, eu chamei a isto uh, Tavira ontem é hoje, porque as histórias de Moras Encantadas não morrem nunca, estão sempre vivas. E estão sempre vivas porque têm a ver com os nossos antepassados. E aqui, especialmente no Algarve, mais do que nunca. Ora, uh, isto é a terra da Morama, que tem cinco exceções que... Uh, não, na, nesta história não caberão todas... Mas, portanto, a Morama é considerada nas lendas um grupo étnico, uma povoação, um país longínquo no norte da África, de onde eles vieram, um mundo subterrâneo paralelo, onde ficaram encantadas, e uma região mítica. Essencialmente, nós vamos falar das duas últimas, porque é o que interessa nesta história. Uh, <coughs> Portanto, temos aqui os nomes Tavira, Sequa, Gilão e Poço do Vaz Varela, que são algumas das lendas. Ora, Tavira uh, tem designações anteriores de Tavila, Tabila, que se equivalem. A Sequa, o rio Sequa, porque o rio é dividido em dois nomes e tem, tem razões para isso, o rio Sequa. Uh, os romanos chamaram-lhe Sequana e Sequana é também o nome uh, do rio Sena nasceu na gruta da deusa Sequana e vem de duas palavras uh, pré-romanas pré, uh, que não se sabe porque o, o, nós temos as designações que temos para as coisas vêm através de uh, gregos romanos e fenícios. Uh, chegaram cá, não sabiam as palavras, não ouviam bem, não percebiam, não sabiam o que é que queriam dizer e diziam palavras aproximadas. A verdade é que todos foram gastando as mesmas palavras, o que mais ou menos nos dá certezas daquilo que dizemos. Portanto, eu já vos explico o que é que quer dizer, só vou explicar neste momento o que é que quer dizer o an. O an, ou ave, é a palavra mais antiga da humanidade e quer dizer mãe, avó, tia, antepassada e mais tarde o homem também, quando muda de, do matriarcado para o patriarcado. 
Portanto, e, e com esta designação, temos aqui todo um, um conjunto de, de rios que querem dizer todos a mesma coisa. Eu já falo disso. O Gilão. O Gilão deu-me um cabo da cabeça descobrir o que é que isto queria dizer. Porque medievalmente chamam-lhe Gilaon, no tempo da, da Reconquista. Depois chamam a zona Gilá. E o que é que quer dizer? Gil, lá, lá, vou-vos dizer que quer dizer brilhante, por exemplo. O Vaz Varela, que é uma das lendas mais importantes que consta no livro, quando o contador a contou ao Taí de Oliveira, nos finais do século XIX, chamou-lhe Poço da Vaza Amarela. Ora, isto muda tudo, porque Vaz mais a mar, que dá o amarelo, é uma coisa completamente diferente. Uh, Posso-vos dizer que uh, vaz quer dizer habitação e o amar pode querer dizer... Uh, espera aí, está aqui. Uh, santuário. Uh, e outra coisa, espera aí, que eu tenho umas cábulas. Uh, banho. Banho. Uh, e também queria dizer-vos outra coisa que é muito importante. Uh, tradicionalmente, uh, os humanos entraram na, vieram da África, como toda a gente sabe. Uh, portanto, todos nós temos antepassados pretos. Por isso, escusam de estar cá com tretas. <risos> e então, uh, tradicionalmente, vieram para o lado oriental da África. É completamente descabelado, porque não é possível. Por uma simples razão, uh, o norte da África aqui, a zona de Marrocos, estava ligada, uh, praticamente, quase passava a pé, uh, até uma determinada altura da humanidade, ou seja, quando foi uh, o, grande, o grande gelo, a grande glaciação, uh, passava-se a pé. Ora, sabe-se hoje que o ser humano... Uh, o Homo sapiens mais antigo, neste momento, é exatamente da zona de Marrocos, que é uh, da zona de Jebel Irud, uh, e que o do lado etiópio é 200 mil antes de Cristo, e o de Jebel Irud é 350 mil antes de Cristo. Portanto, uh, a nossa população, incluindo a do Algarve, mas uma população que através do ADN que se tem estudado, vai até à Finlândia, é Berber, ou seja, da zona aqui do norte da África. Uh, portanto, isto era uma parte do que eu queria dizer a este respeito. Agora, vamos a outras palavras, a base nas línguas pré-romanas, sejam elas quais forem, pronto, é sempre a mesma. Tav, Sec e Gil querem dizer rio mas com características diferentes. Tav e Sec querem mesmo dizer rio, e Gil quer dizer, Gilão, quer dizer uma coisa que foi o que me deu cabo da cabeça, mas afinal estava lá escrito nos mapas antigos. Uh, é o sapal, mas o que é um sapal? Um sapal é um pântano. E eu que o diga que já das duas vezes já fui mordida e tive que ir para o hospital com uma infecção do mosquito. Uh, portanto... Um, andando para trás, o que é que eu quero dizer aqui? Tavira, por exemplo, Tav mais Ira. Uh, Tav quer dizer rio. Ira pode querer dizer muitas outras coisas, mas uma das coisas que quer dizer é veneno. O que, e também quer dizer, há uma palavra que forma a segunda parte da palavra Tavira, uh, que está no livro, eu agora não sei de cor, que quer dizer embocadura, portanto, é a embocadura do rio, o que tem toda a lógica, porque os rios são as coisas mais importantes da humanidade para o ser humano. Sem água, as pessoas não viviam. Portanto, o, o ser humano deu aos rios os nomes do seu próprio corpo. Cotovelo de rio, uh, o delta que é a mão... Um, Há várias expressões que nós ainda hoje utilizamos 
que vêm desde a pré-história do, do Paleolítico, digamos assim, desde o princípio do, da humanidade. Depois, em relação ao Sequa, quero dizer o seguinte, vale o mesmo para a Seca, vale o mesmo para o Rio Seco, e no conjunto que uh, certos grupos de estudiosos decidiram chamar celtas, do ponto de vista não do povo, mas da cultura, porque do ponto de vista da cultura é completamente diferente. A cultura é a cultura que se formou aqui durante a Idade do Gelo uh, e que vieram povos para aqui, para a zona da península, especialmente a costa de Portugal e a costa do norte de Espanha, vieram povos, alguns, por exemplo, vieram da Irlanda a pé. E há estudos genéticos que vieram e voltaram para o mesmo sítio, exatamente. Oito uh, mil anos depois voltaram para o mesmo sítio, o que é interessantíssimo. Uh, e uh, isto para dizer que SEC é tão válido como também, por exemplo, o rio Guadiana, que quer dizer a mesma coisa, porque é o Ed de Ana. Ana da avó da mãe. É o rio da mãe. Uh, portanto, isto aqui denota um complexo uh, que tem a ver com a deusa primitiva. Uh, e para eu não estar a demorar mais, uh, o resto depois vamos falando. Isto aqui já vos expliquei e agora vamos aos retratos da coisa. Uh, os retratos temos a margem esquerda do rio daqui de Tavira, do... do do rio de Sequa, Sequa e do Gilão. Tem, isto é o um mapa do Google e isto tem a ver com zonas sagradas. Que o, o Luís uh, Fraga da Silva, que infelizmente morreu o ano passado, creio que foi, que foi o ano passado, ele fez o estudo disto, está disponível na internet, que ele manteve tudo disponível para quem quisesse continuar a trabalhar. E aqui... Como o Rui também me tinha pedido um mapazinho, estão ali eh, três locais sagrados, desde a antiguidade, e que têm a ver com o que eu estou a falar. Que é Santana, a Ermida de Santana, a Ermida de São Brás e o Poço do Vaz Varela. Está tudo naquela filinha que ali vê. Antigamente era um caminho que ia dar a Vila Real de Santo António. Hoje é um emaranhado de casas e de prédios e etc. Esta vista aérea do Sequa e do Gilão, porque chama-se Sequa da Ponte Maldita, mal, porque não é romana. Maldita, quero dizer, chamam-lhe romana, mas não é. Não é uma ponte romana, nunca foi. É uma ponte medieval. Portanto, da ponte medieval para trás, para a montante, é o rio Sequa, que faz parte do grupo do, do rio Seco, do rio da Ribeira da Seca, que teoricamente vem da zona do, do Poço, do, não, do Pedro do Inferno, se juntarão ali, e que vem de um monte muito importante, que é o Monte São Brás e a Serra de Caldeirão que também em tempos, como nós aprendemos os mais velhos na escola, era caldeirão ou mu. Mu, também, quis dizer saber o que era, porque desapareceu o mu da, da, dos livros. Então, mu quer dizer duas coisas. Na, na língua antiga, vai querer dizer um local que é uma espécie de bacia, no um monte, que tem uma espécie de bacia, que está profundamente... Uh, riscado de ribeiros. Não tem grandes rios, mas ali nasce, nasce o rio Mira, por exemplo, também ali, na Serra do Caldeirão, e estes rios todos vêm dali, em especial da zona de São Brás. Uh, e Brás quer dizer o maior, o mais alto, uh, inclusivamente pode chegar a querer dizer o soberano. Portanto, uh, é também uma designação de importância. E para cá é a zona onde começa o sapal, não é? que em tempos foi navegável, como sabemos, e vamos ver a seguir. Esta é uma gravura do século XIX, que mostra Tavira, 
na altura em que daqui, teoricamente, saíam os barcos para as descobertas, porque os barcos saíam daqui, não saíam de lagos, nem de outros lados, era daqui da de, de Vira. É, é, uma, é uma gravura que eu acho muito interessante, que tem a, a coisa de Santana ali, a, a ermida de Santana está aqui no cantinho, a, que, é, que já existia, porque Santana é a mãe de Nossa Senhora, mas é, acima de tudo, a mãe, a grande mãe. Não há nenhum local chamado Santana que não seja santificado desde o Paleolítico, desde os tempos mais primitivos. E se escavarem e quiserem ir abaixo, com licença, se quiserem ir abaixo do sítio onde param sempre, que é nos romanos, se quiserem ir abaixo dos fenícios, vão encontrar, certamente, como já aconteceu no Alentejo, uh, provavelmente até pinturas rupestres com uma mulher, que pode ter muitas facetas essa mulher, uh, muitas formas, quero dizer. Bom, não importa aqui agora, a própria sereia é, tem a mesma significação. E depois temos aqui o seco e o gilão. É inconcebível que os meninos que aqui vivem que aqui vivem, nunca tenham visto, fui eu que mostrei ao Rui estas duas pequenas imagens que estão no cimo de um antigo restaurante, que não, agora já não é, ali ao pé do antigo mercado, ali no rio, ao pé do rio. Isto, estas duas imagens estão ali, mas são imagens uh, muito modernas, devem ser da época romântica, por exemplo, Isto, uh, não, mas pronto. Teoricamente, só podem ser a seco e o gilão, porque estão ali à beira-rio. Não vejo outra... Ninguém diz o que isto é. Mas eu interpreto assim e, pelos vistos, quem anda aí a mostrar a cidade também. Que eu já ouvi. <risos> Temos aqui a ermida de Santana, como eu digo. A própria ermida e depois vista... Ali vê-se bem. Vista do rio. Vista da zona do Sequa, que eu fui até àquela ponte para fotografar, para se ver. E depois temos a própria a ermida de São Brás que eu confesso que não me lembro, já devo lá ter passado, mas não me lembro, que uh, o Luís Fraga da Silva considera que eram bens sagrados. Mas, de acordo com a designação do Poço do Vaz Varela, seria lá que havia os bens sagrados. Mas, mas, não quer dizer que a lenda não se tenha, do Poço do Vaz Varela, não se tenha apropriado da ideia do Poço Sagrado, que é um bocadinho antes, não é? E uh, o contador se tenha enganado e tenha chamado vaza amarela ao poço. Oh, a este poço, que parece um penico, vocês desculpem, que isto está ali assim, a gente custou a encontrar este sítio, andámos doidos à procura disto para tirar a fotografia, porque só há uma fotografia mínima na internet, e uh, é isto, quer dizer, ao menos, já que é um sítio que até tem lá a placa de turística, não sei o quê, uh, e que é um sítio onde existe a lenda mais interessante daqui da zona de Tavira e da zona do Algarve, devo dizer, uh, que seja uma coisa assim, ao menos faziam ali, faz de conta, um, uma coisa que um, uh, como se tivesse, tivesse tapado com madeira e tivesse um... Um, 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 um coisa pendurado para tirar água, assim, uma coisa para o turista ver, pronto, mas pronto, ok. Está ao pé das piscinas, está muito bem. Uh, temos aqui a reconstituição do Luís Fraga da Silva, do mapa que ele deixou, como vêem, está Santana, o Gilá quer dizer, era o nome que já no tempo do, dos árabes davam, uh, São Brás e depois o Vaz Varela, portanto que eu mostrei é, em mapa atual há bocado. E aqui decidi pôr também este mapa de reconstituição da Tavira Islâmica, porque, uh, não sei, lê-se mal ali, a Cária, acho que é Cária Gilá, uh, uma coisa assim, quer dizer a aldeia do Gilão, na verdade. Uh, Cária, Cária, acho que é Cária, não, não consigo ler e não coisa. Uh, quer dizer aldeia e coisa. Portanto, isto é a parte medieval, porque 
ali, vocês estão a ver como era o rio antigamente. Porque hoje o rio é aquela parte mais estreitinha. Foi, foi a terra, foi entrando pelo rio dentro e hoje está toda construída e, portanto, deixou de se ter a noção de como era o rio. Ora, agora, ah, ainda temos uma, a planta mais antiga de Tavira, que é de 1645. Como vê, era muito melhor, tinha muito menos gente. Agora, temos as lendas. Há duas lendas. As lendas é só assim, é a lenda dos amores de Seco e Gilão e a lenda do Poço de Vaz Varela e da Moura Fátima. É assim. A lenda dos amores de Seco e Gilão é uma lenda de moras tradicional, de amor e morte, só que acaba de uma maneira completamente diferente porque é assim. Normalmente estas lendas de cavaleiros cristãos que se apaixonam por moras têm um significado. A Moura é a representante da, da deusa mãe e, como, como tal, uh, o casamento representa a apropriação da terra. Ao casar com a Moura, o cristão apropria-se do, do território do povo anterior. É assim pelo país todo. Aqui é uma coisa que é assim, apaixonaram-se, os pais não queriam e mataram-se os dois. Um atirou-se de cada lado da ponte. Pronto, a história é muito simples. A outra é muito mais complexa e é muito comprida, mas tem uma graça que esta Moura Fátima foi encantada pelo pai no tempo da Reconquista, por mil e um anos. E foi posta protegida por um dragão. E é assim, normalmente as moras são inócuas, não fazem mal nenhum. E, tu, e todas as histórias de moras requerem segredo. Várias coisas, uma delas é o segredo. Então, esta é a única mora que é péssima. Há muitos relatos que ela é péssima e que as pessoas até evitavam passar por o poço porque tinham sofrido tareias. Há, há um homem que decidiu fugir daqui... Por todas as noites a Moura vinha, aparecia e lhe dava-lhe uma tareia. Porque ele tinha-se tinha feito a Moura. E a Moura não achou graça. Até porque também se veste de preto, que também não é normal. Tem uma coisa característica que todos têm aqui no, na zona do Algarve. Tem um fez vermelho na cabeça. Então, mas há outra parte da lenda da Moura Fátima, que é a do, da criança que passou, ela tinha os figos a, ao sol. Uh, e a criança passou e quis tirar um figo. E a mãe disse, não, não, não tiras nada. E ela veio, dá um figo, ou dois figos, ao miúdo, e o miúdo mete os figos no bolso, e quando chega à casa, vai dar à irmã, e são duas moedas de ouro. Portanto, ele manteve o segredo, e foi-lhe dado a recompensa. Foi-lhe dada a recompensa. Portanto, são coisas que são muito engraçadas. Estas são as lendas. Vou andando. Um, agora, os locais uh, hidrográficos de importância mítica. Porque, assim, num outro trabalho que nós fizemos, uh, no outro trabalho que nós fizemos, eu porto mal, uh, foi, uh, que é aquele Portugal, Mundo dos Mortos e das Moras Encantadas, que foi considerado o primeiro trabalho no mundo feito... Uh, com aquela orientação, mas pronto, mas não é nada do outro mundo. É, a gente deu-lhe uma orientação de acordo com o tipo de história de Moras. Uh, nós estudamos o mito da, da, das Moras ligados aos rios, etc. E não só. Uh, estas coisas trouxe as imagens. Uh, esta é uma imagem que eu tirei da internet, porque hoje não é nada assim, ou que, que eu saiba. Não é? Acho que nem se pode lá ir. É. Uh, e, portanto, esta tirei. Achei que era bonita, tirei. Pronto. Uh, são, uh, depois tem o Val da Seca. E agora, a seguir, vou-vos mostrar uma reconstituição paleo, uh, paleolítica do Luís Fraga da Silva de como era o Val do Gilão e da Sequa, na, e da Sequa na, na Antiguidade, que eu acho isto interessantíssimo. 
pavira, seria aquele buraquinho, aquele pintinho vermelho aqui do lado de cá, em frente ao esteiro da Lagoa. Eu acho estas reconstituições muito interessantes, porque pronto, é uma maneira de nós percebermos como eram as coisas noutra época. Uh, depois temos imagens do rio Seco, imagens do Gilão, esta primeira uh, do lado esquerdo, uh, uh, quer dizer, é o Gilão ali onde estão os mosquitos que nos mordem, ao pé da ponte. Uh, eu apanhei com certeza uma maré muito baixa, porque eu, isto eu saía muitas vezes de muito cedo e dava para isto. A outra, tirei a outro dia já da ponte nova. E aqui o Gilão vai correndo e até desaguar no mar. É o desaguar no mar, desagua num sítio chamado Quatro Águas. E essas quatro águas fazem parte de um complexo mítico ligado aos rios e ligado à tal cultura celta. Porque eu não expliquei há bocado quem eram esses celtas paleolíticos. São os povos que se juntaram aqui na época do gelo e que viveram aqui em conjunto povos de diversas proveniências desde os autóctones até outros que vieram de outros lados. E acontece, pelo menos no tempo do menino de Lapedo, segundo o estudo que foi feito na altura, viviam, ao todo nessa época, 5 mil pessoas na Península Ibérica. Uh, o que é que acontece? Acontece que esse grupo humano criou uma cultura própria, que era a mistura de todas as outras, de, todo, de tudo o que traziam. E manteve uma coisa extraordinária, que é dito pelos romanos muito mais tarde, que nós mantínhamos os nossos costumes, a nossa história e a nossa legislação oral. Era tudo passado oralmente. Uh, portanto, essa oralidade, eu penso que foi o momento em que nasceram os contos, as lendas, etc., porque... É extraordinário que pessoas que estão fechadas em grutas durante milhares de anos, em grutas, não, aqui viviam à, à vontade como hoje, durante milhares de anos, mantêm a memória, gerações atrás de gerações, a memória do sítio de onde tinham vindo. E há estudos ingleses que provam que vieram para aqui e voltaram exatamente para o sítio dos, dos antepassados em Inglaterra, que isso eu acho uma coisa absolutamente extraordinária. Mas, portanto, vai desaguar aqui no mar, exatamente nas quatro águas. E eu consegui uma imagem também uh, da, do Google, que demonstra exatamente como se juntam ali os rios. Isto faz parte do tal complexo que vai desde os poços, etc. Uh, e o Algarve está cheio de poços, está cheio de, uh, de gente... Uh, que vive debaixo do, do chão, são os vizinhos, é Moira, é o vizinho, que vive debaixo. Não podes atirar muita água, que é para não incomodar os vizinhos, não podes fazer muito barulho, isto é o que dizem as lendas, para não incomodar os vizinhos. Eu acho isto extraordinário. Até porque houve uma época em que se enterravam os mortos da família debaixo das, das próprias casas, pronto. Portanto, esta é a parte ligada aos rios, não vou entrar em mais pormenores. Há, há o Letes. O Letes foi o antigo nome do rio Seco. No tempo do, do Moro Raziz, ele chamava rio Letes ao rio Seco. Realmente hoje o rio está seco, mas tem uma característica importantíssima. É o sítio onde há mais lendas de Moras em todo o Algarve. É ao longo do rio Seco. E depois há o Guadiana, que eu já falei há bocado, que quer dizer o Ed, Dana, Rio de Ana, uh, portanto o Rio da Mãe. Como no fundo o Sequa, quer dizer, na mesma. Uh, e deste Rio Guadiana saíram povos que foram, uh, como é que se diz, uh, co uh, colonizar e conquistar uh, vários povos na várias terras, como a Irlanda, a Escócia, zonas de Inglaterra, como o país de Gales. Portanto, saiu tudo aqui. Foi tudo aqui do rio Anas. 
que durante um tempo também foi chamado Ano. Pronto, vamos andando. Ah, o rio Letes. O rio Letes é o rio do esquecimento. A gente sabe através do rio Lima. Lá em cima, no norte, que os romanos se recusavam a atravessar o rio Lima porque tinham medo de esquecer a vida que tinham vivido. Ora bem, para ser um mito, tem que ter uma contrapartida. E a contrapartida é aqui o rio Letes. Porque aqui esquecia-se quando se nascia. As memórias que as crianças trazem quando nascem eram perdidas aqui no Rio Seco, não é? E lá eram as da vida presente. E nós arranjamos assim umas coisas. Agora, temos aqui um outro culto também de, de cariz, de cultura celta, que é o culto das cabeças. O que é que acontece? As cabeças, é para, para a cultura celta, é a cabeça é o ponto fulcral do ser humano. É onde se encontra, tenho que ir à cábula, é onde se encontra a energia vital e, e as qualidades. Quando se cortavam as cabeças, não era só para expor que tinham conquistado o inimigo. Não, era para expor que tinham adquirido as qualidades do inimigo também. E o brasão de Tavira, como verão aqui, tem duas cabeças. Enfim, aqui tem a cabeça de um rei, deve ser o Dom Afonso III, e tem a de um moro. Mas Évora, por exemplo, também tem duas cabeças. Agora também é um moro e, e se calhar, o, o fulano que conquistou Évora, que agora não me lembro como é que ele se chama, o Geraldo, sem pavor, que era um mercenário. Mas a verdade é que, o, em Évora, o brasão antigo não, tem, não tinha essas cabeças. Tinha duas cabeças de um homem e de uma mulher, uh, que é o Évora... A Évora e o Évorinho, que eram filhos do Elbur, que era um gigante, que era, como é que se diz, tinha os dois sexos, como é que... Era hermafrodita, mas não era hermafrodita sempre. Portanto, como, como mulher, arranjou um homem e teve, já não sei se foi a filha, se foi o filho, e depois como homem, arranjou uma mulher e teve o outro. E depois, os dois irmãos ficaram a tomar conta da cidade e também houve ali uma guerra de poder e acabaram por morrer os dois, caíram da janela abaixo e morreram os dois. Mas isso é a história de Évora. Agora estamos em Tavira. Uh, portanto, andei para trás? Não. Uh, o que eu quero dizer com isto é que o culto das cabeças tem outras facetas também os habitantes da cidade não deram por elas. E se calhar vocês também já passaram por lá e não deram. Que são uma espécie de gárgulas que existem. Estas até estão ao nível dos nossos olhos na rua, no jardim, na rua Pai Pés Correia. As gárgulas são imagens interessantíssimas em qualquer sítio. Tem muito mais do que se lhe diga, do que se estuda na história da arte. Uh, não tenho a vida para tudo, eu. E então, tenho aqui tirei as fotografias de tudo o que era gárgulas que eu encontrei aqui em Tavira para vos mostrar. Esta continua a ser no mesmo sítio, porque são, acho que são quatro. Depois há aquele leão, que eu não sei exatamente onde é, mas eu acho que é lá para a zona do castelo. E há aquela cabeça que também... Tem estado sempre à vista, agora tiraram a planta da frente, porque também ninguém a via. E eu encontrei-a, porque eu sou doida por isto, eu fiz um livro só sobre o culto das cabeças em Portugal. O culto das cabeças em Portugal vem desde o Paleolítico e desde tempos antiquíssimos. É a deusa dos olhos de sol, ele existe em ouro, existe em potes de barro, Existe nas, nas plaquinhas de xisto, etc. É absolutamente extraordinário. Existe no escoral, há dois corpos, que no meio têm um, uma tigela onde está um outro crânio no meio. E é uma coisa interessantíssima. E eu acho que ah, ainda há uma outra coisa. Estou a falar muito depressa, se calhar, mas pronto. Também a gente tem limites. Uh, as mobilidades pré-históricas. Ora bem, acontece, é só esta imagem. 
Isto pertence a um outro trabalho que eu fiz há muitos anos atrás e uh, são movimentos pré-históricos que saem do Algarve ou que passam pelo Algarve. Começemos pelo primeiro, que é os povos invasores da Irlanda, que saíram todos. A história do Lemor Gabala diz que saíram do Rio Anas. Sempre. Uh, depois há o que está a azul, que é só que vai daqui da, do Rio Anas para a, para a Sicília. É a história de um dos reis míticos daqui do sul da península, um, pré-histórico, está ali a data, 1500 e tal antes de Cristo, uh, que terá saído daqui, ele chamava-se Sicano, uh, e que queria dizer filho do rio, não é? ou senhor do rio, uh, e que uh, fez várias expedições e muitas em direção à Sicília, e se diz que foi o fundador da Sicília. Aliás, nós também fomos os fundadores de Roma, porque foi uma filha de um lusitano que foi fundar Roma. Ela chamava-se Roma e foi daqui para lá. E não é nada aquela história que nos contam. É, é portuguesa, entre aspas, quem, quem foi fundar Roma. As histórias míticas dos reis míticos são extraordinárias. Também ainda está por fazer, porque eu não tenho vida para tudo. E depois, a outra que eu já fiz, que é a história do gatelo, o Gatelo era um príncipe, rapidamente, um príncipe uh, grego, na altura, porque tudo vinha da Grécia, era um príncipe grego que se chateou com o pai. Chateou-se com o pai e foi até ao Egito. Levou toda a família e os amigos. Uh, no Egito, o faraó gostou muito dele e deu-lhe, segundo um, uns, a mulher, uh, a filha, segundo outros, a irmã, em casamento. Só que vieram as pragas e eles tiveram que fugir. E ele, ah, ele distribuiu os amigos todos por todas as cidades do Egito para aprender tudo o que havia a aprender. E ah, quando foi as pragas, chamou-os, meteu-os em barcos e, viemos em, e, via, e vamos embora. Vamos embora, segundo a lenda, ninguém os queria receber em lado nenhum por causa das pragas. E, é, era o Covid da altura. E então, não os queriam, o que não é verdade, porque, porque há um porto de gatelo em ainda deixe-me ver, uh, na Córcega, acho eu, e até há um no norte de Espanha, por isso a imagem é vermelho, o risco é vermelho, para ali naquela zona mais ou menos, que ali há uma cidade chamada Porto Gatelo, mas instalou-se em Portugal. Instalou-se em Portugal e o nome Gatelo é o nome latino uh, do Gael ou Goedel, que uh, é o, o Deus Supremo, não é? como sabemos, dos irlandeses, dos, dos galeses, etc. E, mas esteve aqui durante muitos anos e fazia justiça, alguns no norte, fazia justiça sentado numa pedra que, quando ele morreu, ah, chamou à zona onde se instalou, porque era o nome da mulher dele, chamou-se Cota. Portanto, a primeira terra chamada-se Cota, Escócia, quer dizer deusa velha, Uh, foi aqui no norte de Portugal, onde o, o gatelo se instalou. Mas, entretanto, o gatelo morreu <coughs> e os filhos acharam que isto estava super povoado, pensando que de Aveiro para cima há 5 mil castros, e isto é a época dos castros, há 5 mil castros e um castro era uma zona que tinha a zona lá no alto onde vivia o senhor, com casas à volta, mas depois era autossuficiente, portanto era uma extensão enorme, porque tinha extensão para a agricultura, extensão para pastoreio, portanto era uma extensão, cada castro é uma extensão gigantesca. Então havia muita gente, ele decidiu, chateou-se, quiseram se ir embora os filhos. A Scott era viva. Meteram-se em 33 barcos e rumaram à Irlanda, porque a Irlanda é o que se vê. Dizem que no norte de Espanha, na Galiza, dizem que se vê a Irlanda nos dias bons. Não sei, mas há uma coisa muito interessante que eu vi outro dia num programa na televisão sobre a Irlanda, é que depois da, do, da grande glaciação, quando o gelo derreteu, e a Irlanda foi novamente povoada, a primeira árvore 
a ser plantada na Irlanda foi uma avelaneira que só existe na Galiza. Portanto, é muito interessante isto. As lendas não são todas mentiras. É preciso irmos a pouco e pouco. A, a ciência tem vindo a descobrir coisas que nos dá uma outra visão mais verídica das histórias que são consideradas lendárias. Então, bom, mas eles foram e levaram a pedra. A Scota não conseguiu desembarcar porque houve um temporal e o navio dela incendiou-se à vista já da Irlanda, mas os filhos instalaram-se, pronto, e levaram a pedra. A pedra foi a pedra que no Braveheart é roubada pelo Henrique II, acho eu, foi a maneira que, além de terem morto o Wallace, como diz a nossa lenda, chama-lhe o Wallace, que é o Wallace, um, foi morto o, o Wallace, mas foi também roubada a pedra, porque era a pedra onde os reis, uh, na altura estava na Escócia, onde os, um dos descendentes tinha pedido para ir para a Escócia para se... Uh, como é que se diz? Entronizar um dos reis. E então ficou lá. E, e essa pedra foi roubada e foi metida debaixo do trono dos reis de Inglaterra, que é a pedra do destino, ali é feile, pedra que grita. Ou seja, se o descendente... Por exemplo, se agora o príncipe Carlos, quando se sentar na, no trono, para ser, para ser um, feito rei ou o outro, o Guilherme, uh, se a pedra gritar, ele não é descendente do gatelo. Porque são todos descendentes do gatelo. Portanto, olha, isto é o que eu tenho a dizer, que se passa aqui no Algarve, ou que se passou, e que é lenda, mas não é lenda, porque a história e as investigações vão provando de outra maneira. Tenho muita pena que não se façam escavações. O Rui contou-me que toda a Tavira está pejada de túneis por baixo, quer de um lado, quer do outro, de certeza. Em frente à, à Igreja de Santana há um poço. Há uma torre que tem um poço. Se for por ali abaixo, de certeza que vai dar ao Poço de São Brás e depois ao Poço do Vaz Varela, porque... Tudo isto está ligado. Ao longo da história, as pessoas que viviam mais isoladas tinham que arranjar maneira de fugir aos inimigos. Portanto, isso acontece em todas as zonas do país. E então, os mouros que viviam debaixo do chão eram os vizinhos que estavam, os vizinhos debaixo da cave. Portanto, é assim. Já, já acabei. Muito obrigada. É assim, deita-te no rio e cobre-te com o manto do teu tio. O tio aqui funciona como a avó, a mãe, não interessa. Mas é um provérbio muito interessante que eu descobri no outro coisa que fiz, já não sei por carga de água, mas também tinha a ver com isto, uh, e descobri esse provérbio e achei muito interessante, porque vem ao encontro do que quer dizer o rio Guadiana, digamos assim, o rio Ana, o rio Sequa, tudo. tudo. Pronto, já disse um provérbio. <risos> Obrigado, Fernanda. É uma pena que todos nós nos following uh, around the world can not take place in the next uh, surprise. Uh, people Uh, in this room uh, is invited for one surprise at the bar. Please, at the bar. Thank you, Fernanda. <laughs>